Hey guys, how you doing? Everybody doing good? Welcome guys. <clears throat> Welcome to my world. Won't you come on in? Welcome everyone. <clears throat> Hopefully my thro throat will stay strong. Folks, do me a favor. If you can, share the link on your social media platforms. Invite more folks. And please do be prayed up. Ask the Spirit to fill us. You know how my sessions are run. I trust that the Holy Spirit will be pleased to use me, someone he doesn't need. May he save me from shaming Jesus Christ, my Lord. He's the teacher, we're the students. And I pray he uses me and teach all of us, not just you, but me as well. You know, so do pray that prayer. And then when we begin officially, please, no side talks, no side tangents, no debates. <clears throat> please focus. And pray for the internet connection, because again, you know how it is in Florida. Lord Jesus willing, I need your prayers. Lord Jesus willing, I fly out Thursday to go back to my own state, back to my apartment, all by myself. And I appreciate your prayers, <clears throat> because I'll be pretty much living alone. My brother moved out. He's got his own place, not too far from mine. So I'm going to have to manage by the grace of Lord Jesus Christ. Times are getting hard. It's getting Frustrating for people. People are in panic. They're afraid. All these thousands of people who are dying senselessly, being murdered because of corrupt satanic regimes. <clears throat> and the world is in chaos. Gas prices are skyrock skyrocketing. You have now <clears throat> collusions with China, Russia, Iran. It's becoming much, much worse. But if you truly love Jesus Christ, and you truly believe the Bible is his word, then this should not surprise you because our Lord Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. This is why, please pray for one another. Pray for me. I need your prayers. I'm a man in desperate need of your prayers that the Holy Spirit will save me. We need to pray more, fast more, study scripture because studying the scriptures will give you a peace and a confidence and a joy because that is the voice of God speaking to us to destroy our fears and our doubts and our unbelief. And I'll read a psalm. <clears throat> I will read a psalm for you in a minute to show you what I mean. And live out the faith. Live out the scriptures. Don't be afraid. He truly is alive. The God of the Bible is real. The Bible is his voice. Trust the promises of scripture. And do say happy birthday to Willie Mays fan's mother. Her mom, his, her mom, sorry, man, I don't mean to insult women like that. Willie Mays fan's mother, Scott, our brother in Jesus Christ, she's now 70. And I guess for her birthday, he wants to torture her to have her listen to me. So happy birthday to your mother. We're going to say a happy birthday song. <clears throat> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Mrs. Scott fights, meaning here his mother. Happy birthday to you. How old are you now? 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 All right. I'm not a singer, but obviously. All right. 70. 70 times seven. So Lynn Yeshua just said, what? You throwing up that I just sang your mother a birthday song? Man, what a hater you are, man. <clears throat> what did you say, Lynch Yeshua? Oh, yes. A friend called me from Egypt. The price of bread is high. They can't afford it. So sad. Tell him to cry out to Jesus Christ, our Lord, that he will provide. He's the almighty God. Let's just trust the Lord. It's getting hard, guys. So pray that we don't fear and those who have been blessed financially well off not to cut back on the work of God giving to the church, giving to orphans, giving to widows, giving to hospitals, giving to the poor, feeding the poor ministries. But more importantly, those who are poor, take care of them. Those who are hungry, feed them. That's Matthew 25, 31, 46. Widows, take care of them. Don't come back on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come back on things you don't need. If you have three cars, sell two. Downsize, but do not take away from the work of the Lord. I'm not saying that to try to manipulate a gift to me. No. First are the poor. Take care of them. Orphans, widows, take care of them. Right? Then ministries. And churches that are financially well off, do not give to them. They don't need it. And you know what I'm talking about, what churches I'm talking about. 
So keep that in mind. <clears throat> yeah, so guys, so keep that in mind. And by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's wait for the regulars to show up. Oh, sorry. Pray by the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Pray that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit will fill us and show up and bring more folks to listen because today a miracle took place. Something miraculous took place. <clears throat> I'm not lying to you. Something miraculous took place. Yep. It is, it is mind-blowing that I was just filled with joy and peace, and I was excited to share with you, and I pray the Holy Spirit will sanctify my motives, that I'm not self-deceived and save me from being a hypocrite and never ashamed the Lord Jesus Christ and save me from my failures and my flesh, honestly. It was amazing. It, it, today, the Lord did something miraculous. It was a miraculous encounter, and I'm about to share it with every one of you. I'm, I'm glad Sarah, our sister's here, because this will encourage you as well. So invite folks, <clears throat> and we'll be ready. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to give me the physical health I need to glorify the Lord. And Jihad Yusuf wants to discuss. He watched the documentary on Christianity, so he wants to ask me about it. And depending how long that lasts, if it doesn't last long, we'll go into the Trinity in 1 John 5, 7. Continue my response. And Lord willing, this week I'm bringing on William Albrecht, Lord willing, Friday, if I make it safely back, because I fly out Thursday, he'll be on this Friday. We're going to be addressing the two Protestants that we had a debate with on Mary's perpetual virginity. They did a response, and we'll be addressing it, if the Lord wills, this Friday, according to God's will. Not our will, his will. We can plan, but whatever the Lord decides, he knows what's best. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, <clears throat> and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, please strengthen my throat. <clears throat> Grant my throat perfect health and strength and vigor. That the last thing that <clears throat> goes out on my body is my throat and my sight. Use my sight to study the word in my throat to glorify Jesus Christ with my last dying breath. Please, Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, illuminate our hearts and our minds. Remove the veil from our eyes to see with perfect spiritual sight and to plunge the depth of Scripture and feast on the meat of Scripture. And please, Holy Spirit, perfect the gifts you've given us, the gifts you've given me. Sanctify us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, not to do it for the praise of men. Please, Holy Spirit, this battle we cannot win. And save us from our sinful lust and passions and forgive us when we fail. Please, Holy Spirit, do not give us what we deserve. Purify us in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Feed us the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I plead that blood to cover all of us, our loved ones, my daughters who need to be cleansed of the blood of Jesus Christ, even their mother. Be a holy fire consuming her to repent and fear the Lord Jesus. And save me from my own sinfulness, my pride and arrogance and my ego. To never shame Jesus Christ. To never discredit our testimony. To never slander the name of Jesus Christ, to never fall into any scandals as, as many have fallen. Save us from ourselves. Please, Holy Spirit, remove the beam from our eyes. Grant us perfect self-control and self-restraint. <clears throat> and save me from stammering and stuttering and confusion and perfect my ability to recall the facts, especially scriptural facts, perfectly. And empower us not only to know the facts, but to live out the word, love the word, to be enslaved to that word, transformed by that word, made alive by that word, the Holy Bible, which is your word, your voice, and proclaim without shame or compromise and destroy our fears, our doubts and unbelief. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you, again, fill my heart, my arteries, my lung, my chest with the health I need. Be with us in this conversation. Bring all who you want to be here. May the numbers increase for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. Please, 
I ask you to save us and enslave us to you. Never let us go. Never get a, give us what we deserve. But to finish the race glorifying Jesus Christ as a proof to us that we love the Lord more than this world. And we're not doing it for the praise of men. Please, Holy Spirit, have your way. Bless your servants and use me. You are the teacher. We're the disciples. And bless the internet connection, audio, visual qualities. In Jesus' name we pray. Yel Varafa, Yel Varafa, Yel Varafa, Father, Son, Spirit. Okay, folks, everyone in the saddle, something miraculous took place today, honestly. It was amazing. I'm still, like, numb with, like, how amazing. You guys ready for me to share? Hey, Randall, good to see you. It's been a while. We have not seen you, friend. Now, if I make everyone a mod, we'll have no one who's simply, you know, a viewer. And before I share the miracle, I want to, again, personally thank I have to thank all of you brothers and sisters in Lord Jesus Christ who are prayerfully stepping up to support the ministry financially via PayPal or Patreon. You know who you are. Your reward is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Please do not take offense if I don't reach out to you personally because as you can see, I am trying my best to study, organize facts, produce new blog articles and sessions and more importantly, I'm trying to worship the Lord Jesus and be faithful to the Lord because the number one priority is to know Jesus, love Jesus, worship Jesus, obey Jesus, delight his heart because in his presence, he fills us with joy, love, and peace. It's not just about ministry. It's about knowing him and loving him and having a relationship with him. So Lord willing, I will try to write another post for Patreon sooner than later. But you know who you are. Thank you for stepping up in these hard times, taking a step of faith, because I know people are panicking financially. May the Lord bless you. Your reward is with the Lord, and your reward is the Lord Jesus. Your reward is the Lord Jesus. Our reward is the Lord Jesus. He is our reward. I'm not looking for ranks. I'm not looking for position, honestly. And may our motives never to do things for praise of men or for ranks. May our motive to do the things we do by the power of the Spirit, to show Jesus we love him and we thank him. He is our reward to see him, to be held by his physical arms, to kiss his physical feet and see his physical human face. That's our reward. He is our reward, the love of our hearts. And I pray we mean that in Jesus' name. Thank you, Crisis King. Some of your, Sam, your articles are deep and meaty. May they keep being deep and meaty and may never fail and finish the race by the power of the Spirit with integrity. Now, with that said, are you ready for the miracle? You guys won't, won't believe it. I'm still like shocked. I'm like thinking about it. I'm still shocked. I'm like, okay. Today, my gracious host, this brother in Jesus Christ, who's been hosting me here in Fort Myers, was asked to speak about Islam at a Bible college, which is two and a half hours away. Okay, listen to this, guys. I don't want to give out all the location because I want this brother to be safe. And we have another gracious brother in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ named Eli. His name is Alex, but I don't want to tell you where exactly. And this brother is Eli, and he's been a gracious host. Not only has he let me stay in his home in Haines whenever I come, he owns a car lot, and he's given me a car free of charge to use. Pray for them, and God will bless them for showing love to me, the Lord Jesus' unworthy servant. Anyway, so I went today, two and a half hours, drive, spoke, Guys are going to get blown away. I mean, and I'm hoping he's watching. I hoping, I'm hoping he's watching. I mean, I'm still, again, I'm like stunned, like numb, because God is so real and majestic. He's truly alive, and he loves us, right? So I'm driving back, and I need gas. I'm at a half a tank, and I said, you know, I'm going to stop to get gas. Now watch this, guys. Honestly, it's mind-blowing. Talk about the Lord drawing people. So I drive and I see a gas station, Sitco, and I say, hmm, should I get here? Mm, and I pull in. I pull in. There's someone standing outside the gas station. You guys know what I'm talking about. Sometimes people asking for money. So this person was there. I, I engaged him and I said, you know, glory to the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is loving and merciful and puts it in the heart of his servants to be loving and merciful. Well, I guess as I was thanking the Lord, he said, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. So, so, so you're Muslim. He goes, yes. I go, what's your nationality? You guys ready? What's your nationality? Puerto Rican. He's a Puerto Rican. 
Puerto Rican who converted to Islam. You with me so far? And now you awake? So I thought he's probably Muslim from a Muslim country, born a Muslim home. Puerto Rican who became Muslim. Oh boy. So I so you converted? He goes, yes. He says, my name is now Islam. Did he say Islam Muhammad? I think that's what he said. Islam Muhammad. He goes, my former name was Christian. I spent 20 minutes talking to the man. Now watch here. Now, wait, hold on. I said, friend, this is not a coincidence that you met me. Of all the people you can meet in the world, you met me. I want you to see how real God is, how real Jesus is, and he's trying to get your attention. I said to him, it's not a coincidence you ran into me of all people, a convert to Islam, because I wasn't going to stop in this gas station, but I stopped in this gas station because the Lord Jesus wanted me to meet you. And I go, here is my YouTube channel. I debate Muslims. That's what I do. I study Islam. It is not a coincidence that a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ meets you and now is talking to you. And then I tell him, I want you to be very upfront with me. And I'm going to tell you the conversation. Be upfront. It's just you and me and God is listening. You and me and God is listening. How would you feel of a 54-year-old man? I, I'm 54, and I marry your nine-year-old daughter. How would you feel? And he says, well... The prophet, he knew I was talking about Muhammad. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I go, hold on. Can I ask you something? Who does your God Allah pray to? He goes, what do you mean? You just said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So who does Allah pray to? He goes, Allah doesn't pray. I go, wait. You just said he prays. He goes, what do you mean? The word Sallah, Sallallahu, Sallallahu Allah means Allah's prayer be upon him and his peace. Sallallahu means the prayers of Allah, alayhi, be upon him, wasallam means, and his peace. He goes, oh, that means sending on blessing. I go, no, it doesn't. I go, the Arabic word for blessing is barakah. He goes, yeah, you're right. See, he knew a little bit. And you didn't say barakat Allahu. You said sallah Allahu. So who is Allah praying to? And I go, in fact, there are three passages in the Quran. 2.157, it says your God prays. Surah Al-Baqarah 2.157 says, and upon them is the salawatun min rabbihim. The prayers from their Lord. Salawatun, salawat. And then 3343 says, he it is who prays for you. And so does angels. And then the verb is salah. And then 3356, it says, Allah and his angels pray upon the messenger, the prophet. I go, that's why you're praying for Muhammad because this because yeah, yeah, yeah. And it says, and you who believe also pray for him. I go, it says that Allah and the angels, Ya Saluna, Ya Saluna. So when it says the angels perform Salah, I ask them, what does that mean? He goes, oh, they pray. I go, but hold on. It says Allah joins the angels, Allah and the angels, Ya Saluna. So Allah prays too. He goes, yeah, he does. Allah is sending his Salah upon the prophet. I go, so who does he pray to? I go, now let's come back to the question. A 54-year-old man has sex with a nine-year-old. He goes, well, you know, the prophet married Aisha when she was nine, you know, so she can be young and have a family. I go, but he left her without a family. She was nine and she was widowed 18. She had no family, no children. What kind of mercy is this? You know what he told me? Look what he told me. He said, legally, that's what Muhammad did. But he goes, in my heart, I got to be honest. He goes, in my heart, I have, a tr I have a problem with that. That troubles me. I go, you know why that troubles you? I go, let me tell you why that troubles you. I go, because you were created in the image of God. Though tainted, it's not a face. And God has written his law in your heart. So because that law is in your heart, when you hear it, you get convicted. Because the spirit is convicting you that this is evil. This is evil. Because Jesus is calling you. And I go, you didn't know Jesus. Here's my challenge to you. I want you to read the gospel of John and read it with an open heart. Just you and the Lord. And I gave my YouTube channel. I go, watch my YouTube channel because tonight I'm going to go live. And I hope he's listening. I go, watch my YouTube channel and watch Christian Prince. I go, I want you to remember you daily pray 
Allah guide you on Sirat al Mustaqim, on the straight path. Let me tell you who Jesus claimed to be. Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, and I was looking him right in the eye. John 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus didn't say, look, I'm on the way, follow me. He goes, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And sadly, you don't have a father. Jesus says he'll bring you to the Father because if you believe in Jesus, God becomes your father. You become his son spiritually, but you have no father. Because in Islam, you have a master, an overlord, and you're a slave. No more, no less. You don't know what it's like to have God as your father. Don't you want to be a child of God instead of a slave? Well, your only way of becoming a son of God is through faith in Jesus Christ, who is God's son, contrary to what your Quran says. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the son of God, and he wants to make you a son of God. And it's Jesus who brought me to you. I go, have no doubt, this is a miracle. Of all the people that ran into you, I ran into you because Jesus sees you and hears you and he's calling you home. Time to come home. And that's what I left him with. Tell me that's not a miracle, guys. That's John 1, 12 to 13, exactly, Christ is King. Tell me that's not a miracle. What are the odds? Please convince me. And I'm still like numb with disbelief, like I'm shocked. What are the odds? Today... As I'm coming back to make a two and a half hour trip, my gas tank is half full. It's not empty yet. And as I'm passing by, so I said, go, I go, mm. in fact, I was in the left lane and I had to then jump immediately to the right lane to get into the gas station. And he's standing there and I run into him today. Of all the people you can meet, I go, guy, you don't know how miraculous this meeting is. Of all the people you could meet, you met me. And let me tell you, I debate Muslims. I've studied religion. And I show them why Jesus Christ is Lord and the Son of God. Now convince me that wasn't Jesus having me at the right, right place at the right time because Jesus is calling that man to himself because he never knew who Jesus was. And here, you want me to shock you even more? Okay, let me shock you even more. I was, to, I was supposed to fly out last week. I actually canceled my flight. And I had to then repurchase another ticket for $300. I'm not trying to say it because I want, you know, to manipulate, God forbid. And extended my flight for Thursday. I was supposed to fly out last week. What day was it? I was supposed to fly out. And then Alex contacted me. Oh, I was supposed to fly out. Was it Sunday? Anyway, Alex, my friend said, hey, man, can you stick around? And I did. And I'm leaving Thursday. Had I left last week, I wouldn't have met this man. Because God is almighty, his will shall be accomplished, right? He'll even use our actions and desires. And there are times in which God will override your will and constrain your will. God can do that. He does that, right? And I met this man. Now I understood why. And here's what's even more shocking. Alex went to this college two and a half hours away. And I thought, you know what? I told him I was going to come yesterday. But you know what? I said, I was thinking twice about it. I said, you know what? It's too far. I don't think I'm going to go. Because he had an 8 o'clock session he was going to teach and a 12.15 session. Or, yeah, 12.30 session. I said, you know, I'll leave 6 in the morning. But then I woke up at 6. I got tired. I said, you know what? I'm just going to sleep in. Glory to God, I woke up at 8 in the morning. And I said, you know what? I'm going. I was about to skip going to his class, and had I skipped, I would not have run into this young man. Can you tell me what the odds are? Can you tell me what the odds are? Okay. Now that said, I want to read Psalm 73 for you. In fact, let me see if I can have it online, where here we can have it read, because, you know, you have on YouTube, thank God for modern technology, all you do is pay for internet. Some people learn the Bible better by hearing it read. You go to YouTube, they have the Bible being read out loud. Let me now find it because I want Psalm 73. I want you to listen to this. Okay, listen to this. We'll play it. Psalm 73. Okay, here you go. Yeah, we don't have a commercial. Listen to this as I take a moment. Hey, listen. Listen to the words why.
Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Now, the reason why I'm playing this psalm for you, I want you to pay attention. Asaph is starting to lose faith. He said, my foot almost slipped because he's seeing the wicked, the evil, the murderers, the slanderers prospering. They're getting rich. They're becoming more powerful. And the poor and the righteous are being oppressed. They're being abused. They're being persecuted. And he's losing faith. God, how is this possible if you're real? The same reason why Bart Irma lost his faith. Now, how then do you restore your faith or keep from faltering? Listen, Psalm 73 is beautiful. Listen to the remedy that how the Lord Jesus protects you from falling away from the satanic temptations where you see the wicked prospering, getting more rich, and we're suffering. Listen. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. See, in vain. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. You know what he's saying? Did you see, he goes, man, I'm wasting my time keeping myself pure and undefiled spiritually. You know, but if I had said this, I would have betrayed you, my God, in, in <clears throat> the minds of those who'd come after me and read these words. So then what do I do to stop myself from doubting and slipping? Here, listen to this. Watch. What's, guys, solution. Please, I pray the Holy Spirit opens your ears. So what was the solution? How did God save him from falling away from faith? Here's the solution. Listen. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation. As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus, my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. See, I became stupid in my thinking. I became like an animal, an idiot for doubting you, my God. Because you will awaken to destroy the wicked. In your time, not mine. And this is why it says, be still and know I am God. Hold your peace. Jehovah fights for you. In his time, not yours. Be patient. Let him finish it so I can, again, sum up the point of Psalm 73. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel. And afterward, receive me to glory. Receive me. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
for indeed those who are far from you shall perish you have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry but it is good for me to draw near to god i have put my trust in the lord god that i may declare all your works there you go what's the answer how did he <clears throat> how did he <clears throat> prevent himself from completely losing faith and like Bart Ehrman becoming an atheist, he goes, when he went into the house of God, when he went to the sanctuary of God, his faith was restored. What does he mean? Okay, now here is the solution. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Listen, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 Verses 14, 18 says, believers do not yoke themselves with unbelievers because they will have a corrupting, ungodly influence causing you to doubt. So what does Psalm 73 say? The further away you are from the house of God, from the people of God, the less time you spend with believers who are filled with the spirit, spiritually mature believers, brothers and sisters who truly love the Lord and seek to live the Lord. The less time you spend with them, the more time you spend away from them, from church, from fellowship with mature brothers and sisters in Christ and qualified spiritual leadership. And the more time you spend with unbelievers and the more time you fellowship with people of the world, the more <clears throat> doubts will creep in until finally you lose your faith completely and you become like one of them. Psalm 73. He goes, until I went to the house of the Lord, then my faith was restored. My mind was rejuvenated because instead of being surrounded by ungodly influences, seeing the wicked, the immoral, the adulterer prospering, getting rich, living heathen, hedonistic lifestyles, whereas the poor suffering, <clears throat> the righteous being persecuted, thinking then. Why even waste my time? It's all. Then it came to me. God is real. He lives. And there's a day in which he will bring the wicked into judgment. His timing, not mine. He is patient. I wait on him and not try to hasten his timetable. Psalm 73. Okay. So there you go. Solution. If you're starting to waver, and I guarantee you the reason why you're wavering, you're spending more time with unbelievers. More time watching programs you shouldn't be watching. More time seeing how the wicked are prospering. Like here, I went to an event. There was a billionaire sitting on my table. A billionaire. A woman with hungry eyes, not satisfied. If the wrong guy had said something to her, and again, I don't know for certainly God knows hearts. May he forgive me if I'm judging presumptuously. I wouldn't be shocked. If she had engaged in adultery, extramarital affairs, and I wouldn't be shocked her husband's doing the same thing. A billionaire on my table. I'm not exaggerating. Okay. May God save us from that and thinking we're better than them. Without Jesus, we're no better than them. Right? So if you surround yourself with these people, you're going to say, wow, they're billionaires. Wow, they got yachts. Wow, look, man, they're la living life, you know. Lavish lifestyle. Look at us Christians. We're struggling. Look at these ministers begging, quote unquote, people to support them on Patreon, PayPal. This is not living. Yes, it is. This is true living because this is temporary. And you're a vapor here today, gone tomorrow. But God endures forever. And here, let me read 1 John 2. Well, let me have it read for you. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Okay. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. And we begin. I'm going to call it jihad. Okay, here it is. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17. Here you go. You ready? 1 John 2, 15 and 17. I don't want the entire chapter, but I guess they're reading the entire chapter. Okay. Yeah, here it goes. I hate these commercials. Quiet. It's time for church. There are no churches in this town. Yeah, yeah, okay. Hello. I'm David Liesenfeld, pastor of Rock Valley Christian Church. Thank you for joining me for this time of prayer as we okay. look at 1 John chapter Listen. 2, 
verses 15 to 17, and they say, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Let me let me reread it now. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, money, mansions, homes, yachts, status, attention, sex, right? The lust of the eyes, right? Covening, envying, wanting, the pride of life. Look at me. Look how rich I am. Look how muscular I am. Look at how many people love me. Look to me. Look at my bank account. Is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now watch this last part. This is the key. The last part. And the world is passing away. This evil world will be destroyed by the fire that comes from the presence of Jesus and be transformed into the world of righteousness. No more wickedness. So this world is passing away and the lust of it will be destroyed when the Lord Jesus returns. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Okay? Abide Hello. forever. Hold on. I'm so I want him. Maybe let's say his prayer. Let's see if he's got it. It's a short clip, so let's play it. Point out to us a very simple choice that you and I make every day. Are we going to be driven by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? That is the way the world would look at life. And be driven by that, thinking about what pleases us without how it might impact other people. Or are we going to look at life according to the love of the Father, who because of his great love was willing to sacrifice even his own son for us, and Jesus to lay down his own life for us as well, voluntarily that we might have life. For he did not come to be served, but rather to serve. Are we going to choose our own way to serve ourselves? Or are we going to choose God's way to serve God and to serve others? Amen. This is the choice that we make every day. This is the choice that you make right now. For this day, how will we live our lives? There's no other way apart from the love of God that produces a way of living that is repeatable for all eternity. Because in God's love, there is humility. There is goodness. You never have to stop being good. You never have to stop being kind. You never have to stop being giving. God's way of love Listen. works for all mankind, for all people, forever. And it is the best way to go. And that is why he says, the will of God and those who do the will of God abide forever. But the world in its way, even its lust, it won't last. It's coming to an end. And so today, let's make a choice that's everlasting. Let's make a choice for God. Let's ask for his blessing that we would let go of the ways of this world and we would choose the one thing that lasts forever, the way of God, the will of God. Let's pray. Amen. All right, there you go. All right, we're going to call now Jihad Yusuf. Now, the gentleman, his reaction, I didn't spend enough time to engage him because I wanted him to reflect on how miraculous the encounter was that Jesus truly showed up for him. Of all the people in the world, he met me, someone that debates Muslims, destroys Islam by the power of the Holy Spirit, all glory to the Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. That's not a coincidence. So pray for him. The man's name was Christian. And I told him, I go, it's, you need to come back to the real Jesus, our Lord, and <clears throat> abandon Islam Muhammad. Because the name Christian is a beautiful name, means you're a follower of Christ. So you need to come back to the name you were given, not the name you adopted, Islam Muhammad. Okay? Everyone with me there? No, it hasn't frozen. Everything's good. So, Lord willing, let's call Jihad Yusuf. He told me he's now starting Doubt Islam, but he still doesn't, doesn't want to follow Christianity just on emotion. So... Let's call Jihad Yusuf. Let's see how long it's going to last. I hope it's a serious conversation. Usually he's respectful and he listens and he doesn't talk over and he's listening now. So let's try. Invite more folks. All right, now, buddy. Well, before you say something, Jihad, 
Uh, I don't understand this statement. The only thing which stops me from being a priest or monk is because I'm not married. Well, the only way you can be a monk is if you're not married. What do I do? That's That was like, threw me for a curve. Oh, what's up, Jihad? Talk Who said that? I didn't say that. Not Jihad. Can you calm down? You're not the only one. I'm talking to people in the comment section. You know that, right? I'm live, so I'm talking to people in the comment section. Oh, okay. Okay, what's up? Go ahead. Talk to me. All right, so didn't I? When are we going to discuss the documentary that I said? Go started? ahead, bring up your points. I said I don't watch stuff. If you have points, bring them up. What I got to watch it for you to bring up points? Well, no, I mean, look. So I mean, I'm sure you know that I'm a layman, right? And that I, I'm, I'm not, you know, going out there and studying this stuff 100 percent and coming up with all these artifacts. So I rely on these academics and these documentaries that I watch. All right. So what was the documentary is about their it? field to do this kind of stuff. So I brought up some points to you before, such as the Gnostic Gospels and yeah. the Jesus other thing. I'll spare you that for now. But a uh, different perspective that I got from this documentary was yeah. that they were saying that there were some parallels to the story of Jesus and uh, Josephus and how, no, you know. Yeah, let me point. correct that. Hold on, hold on a second. Let me correct what you misheard. See, this is another thing. When you watch documentaries, you got to make sure you're listening. Not there are parallels between Jesus and Josephus, that Josephus is a Jewish historian. Adopted. Right, his writing, his yeah. writing. Yeah, well, look, I got to make the point because you just misrepresented the documentary, which I haven't seen. It's not their parallels. Josephus mentions Jesus and James, Jesus' brother and John the Baptist. Not that they're parallels. That's what they were saying. Well, from what I understood was that there were stories that were, so there were stories similar to Jesus' stories in Greek not mythology. Not in Josephus, yeah, not in Josephus. And in Greek mythology, I've well, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd have to double check on that. I don't okay, know well, let's go with what you're I'm, saying. I'm not saying I'm correct or you're correct, but, I, you know. I'm trying to answer you. What you were trying okay. to say is that there are pagan parallels to Jesus, not Josephus. Now, my my challenge to these the people. The works, the stories of yeah, Josephus. My challenge. Okay, what yeah, I, mean. I want to let me say it a third time because you're too excited. You got to listen a little better. The works of Josephus do not show any pagan parallels to the life of Jesus, because Josephus is a historian that comes after Jesus. He's writing in the 90s, that's around 60 years after Jesus, and he's giving you a history of what happened to the Jews, especially up to that time after Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed. So if you listen, I'm going to explain to you what Josephus is doing. What you're referring to is the so-called pagan parallels, where supposedly you had dying and rising gods. Right. No, you don't. There is no pre-Christian. This is a fact. There is no pre-Christian literary evidence of a God becoming man, dying physically and rising physically and ascending physically. Well, that's not the argument that these people make. So what's the argument then? They say that that is the case. There were there many is no evidence. Like that Give it to three. me. Give me the source. I know what you're talking about. They don't exist. None of the parallels, supposedly, of Jesus predate Christianity, the closest they get, and I'm trying to figure out, Philostratus mentions a figure, but Philostratus is writing centuries after the Gospels, and he's shaping the life of that character to resemble Jesus of the Gospels. So again, what I'm doing is challenging you. When you heard those people, you should have said, okay, name of the God and the name of the document that supposedly predates the Gospels. There are none. Okay. They don't exist. Even so, basically, but, what you're saying is when you when you so when these people are talking and they they make their claims, once you dig into the matter further, yeah. and you you basically can get them busted as well. Yeah, there it's it's not Christians who are busting them. Even historians who are not Christians will tell you, as far as the document documentation is concerned, you don't have a God story of a God who dies and is resurrected physically in a sense to heaven. That doesn't exist. This is just a fact. It doesn't exist. I'm not making it up. A scho scholars who are not Christians, who are honest to the historical record, tell you that doesn't exist. If you find anything that's similar to the story of Jesus, it's from sources after the gospel's written, after the spread of Christianity, for the purpose of trying to make the gods comparable to Jesus. 
It's and that's after. After, yes, those examples. I, that under, I was similar. under the impression it would have been before. You have as, nothing before. You know, they said it's the sun god coming in the form of a man. They mentioned a church where it was. It was give, some. Give the deity. reference. Just, it's Mithra. You're talking about Mithraism. The oldest form of Mithraism, that's prior to Christianity, does not see, have Mithra. The son of God. You know, you know all this kind of. Yeah, Jad, if you talk over me, you're not listening. Did you hear what I, I just said? Make a couple things now. Go ahead, my friend. Okay, but you're not go listening. Ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Mithra that you're referring to, you cannot quote a single pre-Christian source or even a source contemporary Jesus that says Mithra is the son of God, born of a virgin on December 25th, who died and rose again. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It doesn't exist. Okay. Here, so let me give you a source on this. Hold on. Hold on. Here, let me yeah, share with everyone else. I appreciate too. that. I would appreciate that. I'll yeah, there's a lot that. of sources, but you simply... Hey, I'm just watching videos here. You yeah, know but what videos? Of who? I sent it to you. No, I but I, you, know, you, see, you don't get the point. Why is it you conveniently listen to those videos of people who spin sources, but in the same YouTube, you can put in pagan parallels to Christianity refuted? Here, I'll do it for you. Just here. There you go. Why couldn't you do that? Simple search engine here. Pagan. Okay. Pagan parallels. Here, watch here. Look what well, comes up. If I discover that, that Christianity is true I'll, and I'm convicted on it, there, I'll, I'll embrace it. Here. But I need, first of all, figure it out. Here. I told you I wasn't going to do anything emotionally. I know the way you guys, you know, I know Jesus in the New Testament is depicted as a kind, good Man, I'm not arguing with that, but that's not enough of an argument. It might work with some emotional ex-Muslims, but me, I need to understand it factually. Here, friend. Inspiring philosophy of someone I know. He's got an entire section on these pagan parallels refuted. See, I just did a search Welcome and it came inspiring up. Philosophy. Yes, we, we like you, friend. Hold on. Let's go to your playlist. Here you go. I'm going to give you his playlist. Here's his playlist, friend. There's about 15 videos in this playlist. Jesus versus Horus. Jesus versus Mithra. Here it is, folks. Thanks, our friend, Inspiring Philosophy. Here's the link. There it is, and here it is for you. How come one search, and I found, there are a couple others, by the way, but this one, he has several, refuting all these so-called pagan parallels to Jesus from Krishna to Mithra, and you can do that search and find it. Here you go. Here it is, and I'm going to give you a written document online. Here it is. Can you click on it and see what you find? And guys, I just gave you the link. And now written refutation of this lie. Okay, are you ready? Written refutation of this lie. Here it is, tectonics.org. Let's go here and let's find it. Hmm. Let's find the so-called pagan parallels. It's right here. Was Jesus copied from pagan gods? Here you go. Was Jesus copied from pagan gods? A comprehensive online written refutation to these parallels. Guys, here's the link for you guys. And here it is for you. See, it doesn't I, take long to find responses to these alleged parallels that are lies. No serious historian of mythology says that before the time of Christ, we have archaeological or textual evidence of a God coming as a man who is killed, born of a virgin and raised from the dead. That's a lie. That doesn't exist. Really? It doesn't. OK, OK, no, let me make it up. I'm gonna make All right. It up. Now, now I'm going to go with you. Now I'm going to go with you. Now I'm going to, I'm for the sake of the argument, because I'm not going to, I mean, you know, this is, this is not something that could be answered now. I need to really do my research into it on my own. Yeah. You gave me the source and I'll, I'll open-mindedly look at it. Okay. So now for the sake of the argument, let's, let's assume what you're saying is right. How can you prove Christianity is true? And I'm still not clear about the Trinity. And it, yeah. What about the Trinity? Not clear. I mean, which one do you want me to start with first? Yeah. In <laughs> fact, you want me to play Bart Ehrman where he says, that the virgin birth story of Jesus is unlike anything in pagan mythology, because that's another connection. Your so-called authority, this send, documentary. Send me that, yeah. I, I used okay. to be. No, I, okay, well, hold on. I want you to hear this out. In the same document, which I did not watch, but I know I've heard these arguments. I've already heard them. Same document tell you the, the virgin birth story is modeled after pagan myths, which yeah. is a lie. And I'm going to let Bart Ehrman refute it. We're going to play him right here. Apostate prophet who's an atheist, who's not a Christian, Interviewed Bart Ehrman just last week. Let's go and see. I didn't watch that one yet. Okay, well, let me get it for you. We're going to play it so you can hear it. Let me just go there. I can't put your – I can't – What? 
it's yours out loud while I'm on the phone with no, you. No, no, I'm going to play it for you, buddy. I'm going to give you the link. All you do is save the links and go watch them later, right? Huh. Okay, here you go. Let me hear. Give you the link. Are you going to play it on your live? Yeah. Okay. Why are you shy, dude? What's wrong with you? Here's the link. I gave it to them. I'm going to give it to you. Here it is, guys. Now watch when he's asked about the virgin birth, so-called these so-called sources that you are referring to. They supposedly also have a pagan parallel to the virgin birth story, and he refutes it. You're going to see he refutes it. Okay? Watch here. Are you ready? Okay. Here you go. Let's play it. Yeah, they're saying, why are you shouting? Why are you so animated? Me? Yeah, they're like, you're like really loud and animated, but oh my. It's okay. Here you go. Let's play it. Let's get to the clip. Let's go where he talks about the virgin birth. I got to find it for you. Just okay. Why is he shouting? Because he asked him 13 questions. And so I want to find the one on the virgin birth. It's got to be earlier. Let's see. Play it on, play it on your live if you yes, can. Yes, I can, brother. But uh, I got a, my brother in humanity. Let me just find the section because I don't want to play all of it. Okay. Let's see. Where does it go? What does Islam mean? Yeah, we know what it means. Let me see if he's got timestamps. I hope he was smart enough to put timestamps. Yep, he did. See, I told you. The virgin birth, 1236. Here you go. Yeah, you the, the same thing about the virgin birth. The virgin birth is, of course, something that is uh, very prominent. Um, you have spoken about it, how that might be or is a fictional account that was added later on, as far as I remember. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but as far as I see it, virgin birth is something that is also associated uh, among cultures with... Uh, a divine nature or divine fatherhood which is why this individual doesn't have a regular human father that basically means he comes from a divine source but islam also has a virgin birth despite rejecting the whole story of divine origin now listen to bart ehrman's answer jihad he is an atheist who's hostile to christianity listen yeah 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 um i yeah so it's true that throughout the greek and roman worlds there were stories of people who were divine who were born of a union of, of a god and a, and a human. Um, and so they're sort of half human, half divine, uh, most famously uh, Hercules or, or Heracles. Uh, but there are, there are a number of others. Uh, in those accounts, um, one thing that's different with Christianity. One thing that's different with Christianity. Listening. Okay, listen. What's the difference? Is that in these Greek and Roman accounts, the woman's never a virgin. Um, she's a woman. She... Usually it's a married woman who's had a lot of sex. Uh, and usually the God actually has sex with her. Did you hear that, Jihad? I heard it. Okay. She's not a virgin. She's had a lot of sex and the gods have sex with her. That's not a virgin birth. But these liars that you're listening to will say, oh, there are pagan parallels to the virgin birth. This virgin. But they don't tell you that virgin's not a virgin because the God has sex with her or she's sexually active. So why would these so why would these Western academics have you to know deceive you, towards Christianity to or deceive why would they you people like you whom they know won't go and check the sources for themselves? Well, what is their motive in doing that? If these you, people well, if you believe there's a Satan in this world, professors and if you believe there's a Satan in this world, he doesn't give a damn if you're a professor, he will still use you. To pervert truth, lie, and deceive. But, but and what's their motive is what I'm saying. What's the motive of educators. Satan? What's the motive of Satan? To deceive. And so why are you shocked that Satan will put in the hearts of people to hate Christianity and twist facts to deceive people? Why? Do you think people are innocent? I suppose. Now, my question is... Okay, let's finish is, it. Don't let, let him finish the part, and then you can ask me. <laughs> and sometimes you get some pretty raucous stories, and pretty funny, actually, about how it happens, how the God pulls it off, because he's got to, like, convince her. And so, uh, and so like, there's identity switches and stuff, kind of like facilities and silence. So, um, but uh, but she, she definitely has sex, and the God has sex with her. And so the issue in the New Testament is Mary is said to be a virgin. Um, not to have had sex. And so it's like these stories because God is the one who gets her pregnant, but it's very hesitant to go into kind of any physical details and it looks like it's not involving sex. So uh, okay, there you go. So she's a virgin. 
the Blessed Mother, who conceives, by the way, without sex, whereas these so-called pagan parallels, the women are not sex. They're, uh, they're not virgins. They're sexually active, and the gods actually have sex with them. So anyway, that just so much for that. Now, what's your other question? So is God the Father a spirit? Yeah, God is spirit, John 4, 24. The Lord Jesus says God is spirit. He is spirit. Okay, so then who's the... How do you differentiate between God the Father, God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit? Because the way they relate to one another, they are in relationship with one another, meaning they're not the same person. So when we say God is spirit, what we mean in reference to God, and you got to listen if you want to learn the Christian faith. By saying God is spirit, we mean that God is not a being like you and I or angels who has a shape or a form, and he's bound to time, space, and place, that he needs space and place to exist in. By spirit, we, we mean from the reading of the scripture, as we understand what the scripture teaches as a whole, he doesn't need space, he doesn't need place, because by his very nature, he is formless, shapeless, and visible. And that's true of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, because their nature is one and the same. How do we distinguish them? Because they relate to one another, they have fellowship with one another. They're in love with one another. And that's how we know it's not the well, same. Well, God the Father is a spirit, then why can't you just say he's the Holy Spirit and then there's a son in the human okay, because form? Because you didn't hear what I said. So are you it's human? Confusing. This is a confusing okay, concept. Are you human? Yes. I'm human. So does, does that make you me? Because you didn't hear what I just said, what spirit means. We'll just repeat it. Okay. So what, you got to listen. Uh, I am listening. But okay. this, this, All right. This let's go repeat again. I just said, God, the father spirit by spirit. It means that his nature, nature of God is unlike you and I or created things. Even angelic creatures have a spiritual shape, right? Some type of spiritual form. And they're still bound to time, space and place, though they can travel much faster than you and I and more powerful. God is unlike that and that God does not need space or place because he is formless and shapeless. But that's not just true of the father's nature because the father's nature is Jesus's nature and the spirit's nature, Holy Spirit. So all three of them have that same nature. So when you say, why isn't he called the Holy Spirit? Well, it depends on what you mean. Is the father holy? Yes. Is he spirit? Yes. But he's not the Holy Spirit because the name Holy Spirit is given to that person who's not the father and the son, but in a relationship with the father and the son. Okay. Do, do you understand? Can, can you understand how that would be confusing for a person to understand? Can you understand that God by his very nature is infinite and beyond comprehension? So unless you think you're God and can figure him out, why are you shocked that you find things about God that is confusing? That's a fair point. Um, so, so, I mean, it's, it's just, I'm used to the Islamic argument of, you know, you know, did God eat and whatnot. So it's okay. But th that's talking about God as God, he doesn't eat, but if God decided, now you got to hear me out. If God decided to become a true human being without ceasing to be God, but he becomes a human to experience humanity, would he be truly human? If he wasn't born as a man? Well, but how could... Oh. You didn't answer no. the question. Would he be truly human? I'm saying if he was truly human, if he didn't sleep and eat and have to take a bath and go to the bathroom, would he truly be human? If he decided to be. I'm not saying did he become. I'm just saying if God, who is almighty, chooses to become human, to experience humanity, not because he had to, but because he wanted to, without ceasing to be God, would he be truly human if he wasn't born? Well, no, humans are born. Would he be truly human if he slept, didn't sleep or eat or go? No, then he wouldn't, right? Right, I mean, if you... So what would you expect God to be like if he became human? If he decided to become human, would he then be born? Would he then sleep? Would he then awaken? Would he then need to eat? Would he then grow from being an infant to a, to a toddler, to an adolescent and... Would he experience all that if he decided to truly become human? Would he? I suppose, I, I, I suppose he could or he could not. If, if he, he did. If he, he became, well, if, he, is he, if he's going to be truly human, 
I mean, a, a God could just put himself on earth as a grown man. Yeah, but if, then that means he's not truly human because humans don't come out of their mother's womb, grown men or women. Then see, that's my point. Then he's not truly human. He's simply appearing as a human being. See, that's why I said if he's truly human, becomes truly human. So you just proved my point. Why does the son not have the same knowledge as the father? I don't know where you get that from because I can show you from scripture that well, the son. Jesus says that I don't know the judgment day. Okay, so that, you're going to take so one God verse. Pray, did God pray to himself? Do, are we going over these same arguments that we've answered five trillion times? It's still did I just tell you Jesus is not the father? So if the father and the son and the spirit are not the same person, I'm using the term person, not because I'm saying he's a person like you and I. So if Jesus is not the father, but he's in a relationship with the father, what do you expect Jesus to do? Not speak to the father? But isn't he the father if I he's just, God? You mean after three times telling you he's not the father, you're still going to ask me if he is the father? I mean, you're, you're being, what, what I'm understanding is it's the father making himself into a human. So he's existing. I'll give you $10 million. So I, it, I will give you $50 million. I'll give you $60 million where I said Jesus as the father became human. Give, I'll give you $100 million and everyone will take Shahada. I didn't say that. Why are you twisting my words? I'm not saying you're saying that. I'm saying the way I understand it is. Can you stop trying to understand it and go with what I say so you can understand what I'm saying instead of what you think I'm saying? Continue. Okay, so one more time, let me ask the question. If God simply appears as a man, and he did in the Old Testament, he appeared as a man, but he didn't become human. He took on a human appearance without becoming human. So I asked you, and I'm going to ask it again so you can walk with me. If God decided to become human, he chose. Because he's almighty, he can do that without ceasing to be God. Could he be truly human and not be born as a baby and be conceived in a womb and grow up from being an infant to a toddler to an adolescent when human beings, to be humans, are conceived, born, and grow? So if he's going to truly be human and he's not conceived, born, and grows, then is he truly human? He wouldn't have the full human experience. You got it. See, you answered the question. See, you just answered it. Would he then be truly human if he chose to become human without having to eat and sleep and rest and wake up? And, and then he wouldn't be truly human, right? Yeah. Okay, so then that's what we're telling you. The eternal son of the father, his eternal word, chose, he didn't have to, to be born as a human from a blessed virgin taking his human flesh, his physical body, his blood from that blessed virgin, while a virgin by the Holy Spirit, so he could truly be human and experience human reality, human life without sin. He chose to do it. He didn't have to do it, but he did it. That's what we're telling you. And so he also could be tempted. Uh, so well, when you say tempted... That's, Humans that's, can be tempted, so yeah. he made himself like a human. No, he became human. He's like us, but not exactly like us, because the difference between him and us, humans are born with a sinful bent, meaning you receive a, an in, a desire, inclination to want to sin. That's why we're always struggling. He didn't have that. That's why the Holy Spirit came upon the Blessed Virgin and made sure the physical body from the Blessed Virgin did not have any sinful inclination or desire he was like adam when god created adam before adam fell because adam wasn't created with a sinful bent he was given free will and the misuse of that free will caused adam to corrupt himself and bring sin upon him that's adam right unless right. you believe that god created adam with a sinful bent no we don't believe that we don't believe that i don't know if you want to believe that we believe that God created Adam and Eve morally pure, innocent, sinless, but he gave them free will. And that misuse of free will would bring about corruption. In other words, if they chose to disobey God, part of the punishment is now they'd be corrupted. Their nature would be tainted. And now there'd be a sinful element that would now become fixed and part of their nature. So let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, 
you have the Jews when they when they uh, see when Jesus came around and uh, claimed he was the Messiah. The way he was didn't go in line with what the Jews envisioned their Messiah would. Which would Jews? Be. The Jews of the time. There, there's there's not thing. one group. See, this is where you're getting confused again. You keep thinking the Jews had the same beliefs. It's just like today. Christians, Muslims, and Jews, you have different branches with different understanding. He was supposed to be a warrior to deliver. No, so you're not listening again. Moment. So you're not listening again. Did you hear what I just said? Let me see if you're listening. What did I just say? You said which Jews. And then what else did I say? Like the Jews of the time. No, that see, that's time the part. You didn't listen. Today. You weren't listening. So I'm going to ask, do it again. I'm giving you benefit of doubt. Just like today, Muslims, Jews, and Christians don't all agree and have differences. The Jews at the time of Jesus, they were not all in agreement. There were differences. You had the Sadducees. You had the Samaritans who had Jewish blood in them. You had the Pharisees. You had the Essenes. They were not united, and they all had different understandings of the Messiah. So listen carefully so I can explain to you the differences. You had the Essenes because they're believed to be the ones who separated from the temple and lived in the desert in the Qumran caves, and they produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. In their documents, they believed in two Messiahs and a prophet. Messiah would be a priest from the line of Aaron, and he'd offer atonement. Messiah from the line of David, he'd be a king and a prophet. That's one Jewish group. Then you had the Sadducees, who thought that only the five books of Moses were inspired. They rejected everything else. Didn't believe you had a soul that was different from your body, and didn't believe in the resurrection. That's another group. Then you had the Samaritans who had Jewish blood in them because these were the nine and a half tribes of Israel that my ancestors, the Assyrians, conquered and had them mix in with other nationalities, creating a new group called the Samaritans. And they followed the Torah, the five books of Moses, and nothing else. And they believed in a salvific figure to come, but they didn't have all the Old Testament. Now that's another group. Then you have the Pharisees who also had a different belief. In fact, in John 1, 19 to 25, it says a group representing the Pharisees asked John, now listen to how many people they're waiting for. They said, are you the Christ? He said, no. Are you Elijah? He said, no. Are you the prophet? So now they were expecting Christ, Elijah, and the prophet. The Essenes were expecting two messiahs and a prophet. The Samaritans were expecting a salvific figure, and the Sadducees were expecting no one. Now let me make it more confusing for you. But listen, because I want to give you history. Then you had the Jews who wrote the book of Enoch. Those Jews thought the Messiah is a divine being, not human, but a divine being who appears human, who was there with God before creation, and who would appear in the latter days and sit on a throne to judge all the nations and the kings, and they would worship him. Okay. So these Jews who produced Enoch thought the Messiah was from heaven, who was there with God before creation, and they called him the Son of Man, the Elect One, the Messiah. Jews believe that? Yes, the book of Enoch. I just said it, the book of Enoch. That's in the Bible. What Bible? That's a Jewish writing, the book of Enoch. What Bible? The Jews that before the time of Christ, during the time of Christ. But then you had a, another document written by Jews called For Ezra. For Ezra, you got to listen, I'm giving you history. For Ezra, and those Jews also agreed with the Jews who wrote Enoch that the Messiah is a heavenly figure because he's the son of man that the prophet Daniel saw. He's the son of God, and he would come with his holy ones, and he would reign for about 400 years, and then he'd die and be resurrected. So when you tell me Jews didn't expect this or that, what Jews? Not all the Jews believe the same. So what do you mean? They were confused regarding how many messiahs, what would messiah do? Would he come from heaven or would he be a human descendant of David like the one, the Jews that produced the Psalms of Solomon? Just like today after Jesus. Do you know what the rabbis believe? Are you ready for this? Go ahead. The rabbis today believe there are I two messiahs. I just want to make a comment. You are providing me a very fresh and interesting perspective and giving me something to think about because I was just so fixated on the narrative I was getting from these 
academics and I didn't even consider that it will, it could have been multifaceted. It is multifaceted. And any scholar admits that. I didn't make it up. I didn't learn this. I didn't invent this. I studied and I've done mm -hmm. sessions on it. So others have now the rabbis today, you ask Tovia Singer who hates Jesus and Christians and loves the Muslims. Ask him when he's lying. Say, uh, uh, Rabbi Singer, is it true that in the Talmud you're waiting for two messiahs? I'm going to give you their names. Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah son of Joseph. Mashiach ben Dawid, David, Messiah son of David. Ben Dawud? Yes. Messiah son of David, Dawud, and Messiah son of Joseph, Yusuf. al Masih ibn Yusuf. Now, He'll tell you Messiah, son of Joseph, will be killed in the great battle that takes place at the last day. And then Messiah, son of David, will resurrect him. So when you say the, the Jews are not waiting, we're not expecting Messiah to be killed. I just gave you one branch of Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, and their opinion, you'll find it in the Talmud after Christ that say Messiah, son of Joseph, will be killed. And Messiah, son of David, will be will be the one resurrect him. So here that means they believe in a dying and resurrecting Messiah. Okay? Okay. So when you tell me Jews, what Jews, man? It's like today, even among Muslims today, well, I mean, you have some Muslims who say Mahdi will come and he's from the bloodline of, of Muhammad. He'll be named Muhammad. And then the Antichrist comes and then Messiah will come and join the Mahdi and kill the Antichrist. Then you have the Shia who say the Mahdi is the 12th Imam. From the household of Ali. I mean, so even the Muslims are all over the map. They don't agree. Yeah, that's, I know that. So then well, uh, don't assume, don't assume that the Jews at the time of Jesus had the same view. By the way, Necro, let me correct that. The book of Enoch, that section of Enoch, which comes at the latter part, some believe that was added afterwards in order to refute Christian claims that Jesus is that son of man of Enoch, others think that it's not saying that the son of man is Enoch, but that they become united together as one. Because all throughout the narrative, Enoch is not the son of man because he sees the son of man and asks the angel, who is he? And all of a sudden, they become united so that the son of man is the heavenly counterpart of Enoch and they join together to become one. But there are scholars who think that's a later addition, and it was added in order to offset the Christian claims that Jesus is the Son of Man. So, Necro, that's just wanted to be clear. So let, me ask you, let me ask you this, Sam. What does it mean to be a good Christian? What, what does it mean uh, as far as action-wise and daily living-wise? you to got 27 books in the New Testament telling you if you really love Jesus, you'll obey his commands. And honor him by doing the things he tells you to do and doing the things he tells you. I'm sorry. And not doing the things he tells you not to do. So doing what he tells you to do and avoiding the things he says not to do. 27 books. How to treat your wife. How to treat your husband. How to treat your children. How to treat your parents. How to treat a fight. What? Is it okay to engage in warfare? Yes, you can defend yourself. Yeah. There's called just war theory. And that theory was actually developed by Christians on the basis of scripture and apostolic tradition. Because Jesus Christ, our Lord, gives you a right to defend your life, the lives of your loved ones, and your property from people who are trying to murder you. But he doesn't give you the right, here's the difference, to kill someone who doesn't accept the gospel. That's the difference. And are there rules for those wars on how you act and how you... How there's you an entire treatise that you'll find, you know, even like Augustine, just war. When is it right to go to war? Count the pluses and minuses and what you cannot do in war, what you can do in war. It's very complicated and sophisticated. Augustine? Yeah, he's one of many. Augustine, yeah. Then they're, they, they're gathering this from the Bible. In other words, they're looking at Scripture, seeing what the Bible teaches, especially in the Old Testament, about how to go to war, what do you do to captives, what do you do... And... So there's captives. Extrapolating it from it. Go ahead. So there's captives. Oh, well, what do you think? You're going to take captives. What are you going to do? What, what? And how do you treat them? Well, we don't do what... Well, I don't want to talk about a song. If I take a captive woman, I cannot have sex with her. I have to marry her. 
and honor as a wife. And if I dislike her, I divorce her and set her free. I cannot sell her and I cannot, I cannot have sex with her before I marry her. That's Deuteronomy 21, 10, 14. Concubines it's much more complicated. allowed in Judaism? And okay. Say again? Isn't concubine, aren't concubines allowed? No, not in the New Testament. You're talking about, okay, now let's go into that a little bit. During the Old Testament period, God permitted people to do things that he hated for a season. And that's not me saying it. Let me explain it. So listen if you want to answer. In Matthew 19, verses 1 to 9, Jesus is asked about marriage and divorce. And what he says is that from the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And he said, the two shall become one flesh. So he's saying that God's design for marriage, one male, one female, they come together in sexual intimacy in marriage and become one flesh. And what God brings together, let no man separate. So then they ask Jesus, well, didn't Moses allow us to divorce our spouses? And here's the answer from Jesus. Pay attention. He says, Moses did that because of the stubbornness of your hearts. But it wasn't so from the beginning. Meaning, God allowed and permitted Moses to allow. Because the commands of Moses come from God. So don't you guys get you let me finish the busted point. with that? Of all you didn't let me finish the point, right? This. So, Jihad, why are you asking me a question that you're not listening to? You're wasting my I, time. You're doing most of the talking, so yeah, because I am listening. It's not that. Because the question doesn't take a one minute. Okay, repeat what I just said. About divorce. Let's see if you're listening. What you're saying about divorce is, is that there was a time during Moses' time when it was allowed. That's all you heard? Well, I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm trying to listen. Okay. Well, if you talk over, you're not listening. I mean, your mind is thinking about how to bring up a response instead of listening. So that's all I said? Is that, that yeah. Moses gave commands from God that allowed them to divorce. Why? Because he knew that their hearts at the time were, were inclined Good. to. Oh, beautiful. You're listening. So what does that tell you? Jesus is telling you during the Old Testament period, listen, God made a lot of concessions because his people were weak and wicked and sinful and not to burn them excessively, he allowed them to do things that God hated for a season. But now with the coming of Jesus, he calls us to a higher level. So now you're getting it. In the Old Testament, God allowed polygyny, having multiple wives. He allowed divorce for basically any reason. Because Moses doesn't give you a reason to divorce. Okay. And he even allowed, you got to listen to this, them to have a human king. All of which God hated. In fact, are you aware who the first polygynist was, the first man to marry more than one wife? Um, I, it was one of the kings in the Old no. Testament. It was Lamech, the corrupt, wicked, murdering son of Cain. So polygyny started in a corrupt seed. Cain, a murderer, condemned by God. It was one of his sons, Lamech, who murdered someone and took... Two wives. Polygyny started in a corrupt line, in a corrupt seed. It didn't start among the righteous, and God permitted it. I got you. So now, so you saw I made some notes on, yes. on what's being discussed. Just to Good for you. yourself, yes. But now uh, Jesus says, and Paul, <laughs> Jesus' servant says, if a man burns with lust, or a woman, he says, each man should have his own wife, singular, and each woman her own husband, singular. No more multiple wives, no more sex slaves, no more concubines. And in the Old Testament, there weren't sex slaves. If you took a woman captive, you couldn't have sex with her. You had to marry her. And concubines, though the term may throw you off, was considered a secondary, meaning a, she was, in a sense, a wife, but not on the same level as an actual wife, and God tolerated that. James 119, okay. I will give you a million bucks if you show me where Cain had two wives. It was Cain's son, Lamech. Very easy. You're saying, how is that different? Because yeah. in Islam, let me, let me explain to you. In Islam, you can take a captive woman, even if she's married, and have sex with her and sell her off. You cannot, I mean, I'm sorry, 
you're not obligated to marry her. And it's not just a captive woman, a married captive woman. If she's taken captive, you can have sex with her and sell her off. In the Old Testament, you cannot have sex with a married captive woman. A woman taken captive, if she's married, you can't touch her. And if she's not married, you can't have sex with her and sell her off. You got to marry her. And if you divorce her, you set her free. So what do you mean, what's the difference? There's a whole world of difference well, between the two. And another one. Yes. Concubinage is permitted at one point. Yes, it was. Bible and and the same argument is applied towards muta and you guys always no that's not muta see muta is no, I'm, no, I'm not saying it's the same but I'm saying no it guys... doesn't apply you're you're comparing apples and pineapples because a concubine is a woman that lives in your house and you feed her and care for her and honor her and don't discriminate against her child in other words she's close enough to be an actual wife Muta, you marry someone for a short period for sex, and when you divorce her, you pay her. How is it the same? So basically the concubines were cared for? and Of course, the concubine lived with you. You provided food, shelter, clothing for them. You didn't just have sex with them well, and dump them. Than a wife. Say it again? Then how is a concubine a different from, from a wife? Because she doesn't have the full status as an actual wife. That's why I say she's close enough to be considered a wife. So what, the, what, what is the difference then between a yeah. concubine and Judaism? It's not as – well, Judaism today, they don't have that. It's not as explicitly spelled out. For example, let's use the example of Abraham and Sarai. Hagar, Hajar, was Sarai's mistress. So Hagar – and she obviously mistress means she lived in a house. She had to be taken care of and loved and provided for. She served Sarai. She was Sarai's helper, Okay. Sarai said, since I can't give you a child, go and have sex with my concubine. When she has a child, right, for me, like a surrogate mother, right, that will then be your seed to carry your name. Because that was something that was okay. acceptable just, at that time. Just, just to reiterate, just to reiterate, and I want just so that it's crystal clear to me, God permitted concubines yes. for yes. the children of Israel at that time. Yes. And the reason is because their hearts were inclined yes. to it at the yes. time, and it was a, it was necessary in yes. society. Well, it's not so much necessary. It's God allowing things. Because, for example, you will not find God commanding a man shall have more than one wife. You will not find, find God commanding a man shall have concubines. These are things they did, and God permitted it, but then gave rules not to abuse those practices, that he tolerated it, Tolerate it for a season because Jesus said God allowed many things he hated for a season. But now with the coming of Jesus, we are called to a higher standard. But then we go back to Islam and now Muhammad brings us back to a lower standard, even lower than that in the Old Testament. This is okay, the problem. Well how does, so if we go to Surah 4, can we go to Surah 4 and see yes. how Allah discusses this? Yeah, what, Surah 424, that... Married women are lawful for you, except those that your right hands possess. What are you not getting? You can't have sex with a married woman. No, but I mean, uh, so how come we can't interpret it in Islam as as God, as God or Allah? Because it says the woman is Operating married. Temporarily. It's the woman is married. It says forbidden for you are married women, except those whom your right hands possess. That means you're taking a married woman captive. And you can have sex with her. What are you not getting? That's Surah 424. Okay, so there's a differentiation. There is a huge difference. From Deuteronomy 21, 10 and 14, she can't be married and you can't just have sex with her. You must marry that woman if she's a captive and she can't be married. Can all this be found in the Bible? Deuteronomy, this is now five times I just said it. Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 14. I'll just go for the whole book of Deuteronomy. Yeah, just read it. Context, okay? Yeah. I'm just saying. Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 to 14. It's right there, the rules of a woman taken captive. You want me to read it for you? Um, it's up you to you. Can. No, you, can. you want me to read it? I can. Go ahead. If you okay, want. here you go. Here. Now, this is 2,200 years before the Quran, supposedly. But anyway, here you go. Let me read it for you. When you go forth to war against your enemies and the Lord your God gives them into your hands and you take them captive, 
and see among the captives a beautiful woman, and you have desire for her, and would take her for yourself as wife, then you shall bring her home to your house, and she shall shave her head and perineals. That's a sign of mourning. And by the way, this is also a deterrent. Let me explain to you the wisdom of God. When you see a woman that's bald, she's no longer attractive to you, right? Bald, yeah, she's not attractive. Okay, so yeah. notice what God is saying. Shave her for a month and wait for her. But you something. understand the wisdom. If it's purely lust you're having, then when you see her bald, you're going to be cured of your lust. But if it's still, you still desire to marry, that means it's not lust. It's true affection that you want to take her in as your wife. So notice the wisdom of God. But anyway. Okay, so you give her a month to mourn. You don't touch her. You don't yeah. have sex with her. And she shall put off her captive's garment, the clothing you you took her captive in, change the clothing. Let her wear a new, new set of clothing so as to honor her, not dishonor her, that you keeping her in the clothes in which you took her captive. She shall remain in her house, and she will bewail her father and mother a full month. After that, you but may go in her. Her husband has to be dead, right? Yes, friend. Which part of father and mother? If there's a husband, she'll say, she, she will be mourning her husband. Bewail her father and her mother a full month, and then you may go into her after a month and be her husband, and she shall be your wife, not sex slave, sex slave right-hand captive. Then if you have no delight in her, you shall let her go where she will, but you shall not sell her for money. You shall not treat her as a slave since you have humiliated her. In other words, by divorcing her. Can you show me that in the Quran? It's, I, I don't know that, but in the Quran. But what I'm what I'm saying is, is that if, so suppose a woman is captive, but her husband is alive. You cannot that touch a married woman. Even if she's not from your religion? You cannot touch any married woman. I'll give you an example. Uriah the Hittite, who was not an Israelite, but worshipped the God of Israel. When David had sex with his wife, Bathsheba, and got her pregnant, murdered him. God condemned and punished him. You cannot have adultery. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. It's that she's another man's wife. It's in not the Ten Commandments. But religion. What? If they believe, let's say it was a pagan god. Which it part of? See, so you're not listening again. I'm going to hang up on you because you're not listening. What are you going to hang up? Because for? I'm you're not listening. You I'm going to give you five. Information. You're okay, I'm going to give you five talking. seconds to bring it down. Breathe and bring it down. Okay, listen. It has nothing to do with ethnicity or religion. It has to do with the fact that she's another man's wife in the Ten Commandments. There is no conditioning. You will not covet your neighbor's wife except if he's a pagan and worships false gods or he's someone who's not an Israelite. Okay, good. You got it. Finally, glory to the trying God. But you don't find that in the Quran. In the Quran, you can take a woman captive who's married and have sex with her. Why? Because... They were kufar, they were unbelievers, they were pagans, idolaters, or whatever. They were not Muslims, and she's your property. Okay. So this law comes 2,200 years before Islam, and it's superior to Islam, even though it's not as great as the new covenant of Jesus. So notice what you Muslims are doing. Not only are you... Calling us to go backward because we go from the teachings of Jesus to something inferior. It's even worse than what we find. And when I say worse, I'm not saying Old Testament's worse, but it's even inferior morally to even the Old Testament. So it's not not only as great as Jesus' revelation, it's not even as good as the Old Testament. And the Old Testament came centuries before Muhammad. Okay. Okay, what else? All right. So now I mean, you, I can, I can, I'm going to definitely rewatch this video to go through what you said again. Yeah. And, um, you know, look at the sources that you were giving me, Book of Enoch and whatnot. Um, now, the, the other question I had is in the just war theory, yeah. suppose there's a just war now that um, Christians were forced to engage in. Yeah, but we don't have a Christian nation. We don't have a government that's entirely Christian governing itself by uh, Christian rules. So you can't give me an example today. 
Okay. There is none. So that's a that's a that's a, a very that's a very interesting thing you just brought up. Why don't why don't we get into that? Okay, get into what? That there is no nation that governs yeah. itself exclusively according to the rule of Christ? Point to one. Is, is such a thing no, no 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 is such a thing permitted to exist and what what would that look like? Well what it would look what like is look if, like? well I'm trying to answer. What it would look like is that if you have people who are truly in love with Jesus Christ and now want to govern according to the revelation of Christ, then that means they'd have to look at the Old and the New Testaments and derive principles that are applicable for today. For example, just to hear me out, during the Old Testament, you could have multiple wives. Well, in the New Testament, you can't. That means those commands given to Israel at that time cannot be applied in the same way after Jesus Christ. So we look to those examples and we derive principles, like you call it qiyas, analysis, how it apply in light of the New Testament. That's the difference. In other words, a lot of the commands given to the nation of Israel cannot be carried out, carried out in the same way today after Christ. So Jesus' revelation is the interpretive lens, the lens that we now interpret the Old Testament. So when we look to the Old Testament, how they went to war, we have to now filter that through the New Testament revelation of Jesus Christ. So it is much more comprehensive. It's not simple. You have to take the fullness of the relation and now interpret the Old Testament light of the new and then extrapolate principles on how to govern the land. Okay. It's not okay. simple. All right. Well, you've given me stuff to think about. You've definitely, you know... You've definitely changed, widened my perspective. Uh, so, no, well, keep calling with questions, and I'm not trying to convert. That's not my job. I hope you understand. And I mean this I don't convert. The Holy Spirit is the one who convert and convince you and prove to you Christianity is true. And then it's between you and the Spirit whether you respond or not. The more the Holy Spirit reveals to you, and the more He convicts you, and the more you see it's true, and the more you resist, the greater your judgment. Okay, I, I hear you. Why don't we just uh, end it here? Okay, friend. Let me let me just uh, think about it, rewatch it. Yeah, and go ahead, man. And we'll be praying for you. So, good questions and feel oh, free I'll to come. watch it. Yeah, you're not okay. All right, and, I appreciate watch, it. Thank you, Sam. And watch that the link I gave you in Spying Philosophy. There are no pagan perilous Christianity. It's a lie. So, if you don't want to read, which, at least I which gave one you was that. Which one was that? It's right there in the comment section. I gave you two links. The first one is the video oh, response. You already sent it all to me. Yes. Tectonics. Yep. The tectonics is written responses. The other one is video responses. Is that the one where it says, was Jesus a copycat savior? That's tectonics, I believe. The other one is from Inspire. You see it. It's right there. YouTube link where the video responses. And the Bart Herman one? No. Okay. If you go back, how many links do you see? I only got, oh, are the, you're talking about in the comment section. Yes. In your comments and on Skype, look, what? how many links? I have uh, 13 questions on Jesus and Islam, um, and I have tectonics.org, Bible apologetics, and then was Jesus a copycat savior? Okay, then that's the one, it's inspiring philosophy. Does it say IP? Click on its videos. It's got to be that one. Here, let me see. It's not that hard. Hold on, let me see. Uh, yeah, Jesus versus Horus. That's the one. I'm sorry, because even the tectonics one. It's, it has the same name. That's why I got confused. Okay, so you got it. I have it. I yeah, have you got it. it. So study got, and take your time and come back. Okay, I will, Sam. Thank All you. Right. Take care, buddy. Take care. Bye. All right, folks. All right. Anyway, um, I'll open up to Skype in a minute because I want to read some snippets from two papers that I compiled on the historical accuracy of the Gospels and the historical accuracy of the Bible overall that God provides overwhelming confirmation the Bible is historically accurate for those who believe so that they know their faith is not misplaced. It's not the evidence that makes you a believer. It's the Holy Spirit that convinces you and you yield to the Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit reassures and reconfirms your faith over and over again for the glory of Jesus Christ that you never falter. So I want to read that, but I'll open up to Skype if you have questions. And then Lord willing, do pray for me, God willing. I may be able to do a session tomorrow, God willing. But Thursday, I need your prayers. I'm flying back to my state. Pray for miraculous 
physical safety protection for my daughters and I. And Lord willing, I'll, when I get back, I'll have top-notch internet and we'll take it from there. And also, God willing, if the Lord is pleased, my daughters are coming to visit me on Sunday. If the Lord wills, pray for miraculous protection for them. They come see me Sunday. I'll have them from the 20th to April 2nd, but that's not enough. Pray in Jesus' name. God will do a miracle to destroy this wicked marriage, this adulterous marriage. Put the fear of God in Martin to leave my daughters so I can have them every day. I'll never be happy or at rest until I'm with them every day. So pray for that miracle. So if you guys want me to, I got a few more things I'd like to talk about, and I'll open up the Q&A. That's up to you. I'm here to do it for you guys. If you want me to shut down, I will. If you want me to continue, notice, guys, when it's a dialogue or a debate, we get over 400, 500, 700. But when it is a topic that's about the core doctrines of the Christian faith, we don't get those numbers. May God put a conviction in the hearts of the Christians, not just to come when it's a debate. We want 1,000, 2,000 when it's just about learning your faith, understanding your faith, and living out your faith as the Holy Spirit teaches us what the faith is. So now just give me one second. I'll play a song for you guys, all right? And then we're going to, I want to read some sentences about the historical accuracy of our scriptures. Are we ready? I want to play this song again, right? And I'm gonna, so one of the I'm most gonna, common new supplement combos you know, that people I can't are doing stand right now this guy. Redwood, this guy talks about taking Redwood. stack it with our brand new Okay, listen. I want to get a notice. Let me give you the links to these two articles. Here's one. This is a very old article, so some of the information is outdated. It needs to be corrected, but overall, it's solid. This is an article I wrote. Here it is. The New Testament documents and the resurrection of Christ. New Testament documents and the resurrection of Christ. And this one is the material that I gathered for a talk I did on what the Quran teaches about the crucifixion, which I linked to in the previous session I did recently on the same topic. Because I'm going to read to you what both conservative and liberal scholars say about the historical accuracy of the Gospels, particularly Luke and Acts and the Old Testament. Are you ready? These are scholars. Some are conservative. Some are not. And some of them converted. Some of them converted. Some of them, because of the archaeological evidence, was overwhelming. The Spirit used that to convict them to repent and become Christians. So are you ready for me to read? This comes from my, the New Testament documents, archaeology and the New Testament. Let me now give you some of the archaeological findings that show the amazing accuracy of Luke and Acts. Findings that were found in the 20th century. In fact, some were even found, I believe, 19th century, 20th century, showing how metec meticulously accurate Luke is leading to the conversion of one skeptic named Sir William Ramsey. So let's read, guys. It's in this article here, right? Let's read it. And these facts are not outdated. Let's read here. It comes from my section called Archaeology and the New Testament. So I say independent archaeological research has solidified the authenticity, historical reliability of the New Testament. Some of the discoveries include, now let me go through the list, guys. You, got, you okay with me going through the list? Some of the facts that the Spirit has given us to know that our faith is anchored in reality, not in myth, contrary to what these atheists and, you know, naysayers would like to believe. Okay. 
First example, Luke refers to Licentius as being the Tetrarch of Abilene at the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry around 27 AD. Now watch this. Historians had accused Luke of being an error, noting that the only Licentius known was the one killed in 36 BC, right? Now, however, guys, listen. Now, however, an inscription found near Damascus refers to freedmen of Licentius the Tetrarch Tetrarch, and is dated from 14 to 29 AD. Luke vindicated. Second evidence. Paul writing to the Romans speaks of the city treasurer Erastus. Romans 16, 23. Pay attention, guys. Be blown away. A 1929 excavation in Corinth unearthed a pavement inscribed with these words, Erastus Pro ed strawit Erastus, curator of public buildings, laid this pavement at his own expense. So a pavement found mentioning this Erastus that Paul mentioned in Romans 16, 23. Third archaeological confirmation. Listen to this. Luke mentions a riot in the city of Ephesus, which took place in a theater, Acts 19, 23, 41. The theater has now been excavated and has a seating capacity of 25,000 people. You guys got it? You with me so far? Pray for Evangelisto D'Azusa's family. Okay, now watch. We got more. Acts 21 records an incident which broke out between Paul and, a cer and certain Jews from Asia, right? The Jews accused Paul of defiling the temple by allowing Trophimus, a Gentile, to enter it. There was a certain section Jews, uh, Gentiles could not enter in the temple. Guess what? In 1871, Greek inscriptions were found, now housed in Istanbul, which read, quote, no foreigner may enter within the barricade which surrounds the temple and enclosure. Now notice they found this, and it's in Greek. Why? Because the Gentiles who come to the temple don't read Hebrew or Aramaic. So they wrote it in Greek. Anyone who's caught doing so will have himself to thank for his ensuing death. Did you catch it? Confirming the accuracy of Acts 21. Another one. Luke addresses Galileo with the title Proconsul. Proconsul, Acts 18.12. Adelphi inscription. Inscription found at Delphi. Verifies this when it states, quote, as Lucius Junius Gallio, my friend and the pro council of Achaia. Are you catching how accurate? Even the titles, the inscriptions to a T, they're accurate. Okay. Again, Luke calls Publicus, Publicus, the chief man of Malta, first man of the island, Acts 28.7. Inscriptions now found <clears throat> confirm Publicis as the first man. They found inscriptions mentioning him. Now, this one is a doozy. Not too long ago, they found the five porticos of the pool of Bethesda, Bethesda, the five porticos of the pool of Bethesda by the Sheep Gate and the pool of Siloam. The pool of Siloam and the five porticos of the pool of Bethesda were found. And these two are mentioned in John 5, verse 2, and John 9, verses 1 to 7. The pool of Siloam and the five porticos, porticos, right? <clears throat> of the pool of Bethesda by the sheep gate, mentioned by John in John 5, 2, and John 9, 1 to 7, have been found. Do you know why that's amazing? You guys understand why that's amazing? Because after 70 AD, this would have been in debris. It would have been buried in debris, and people coming afterwards would have forgotten. And yet archaeology archaeology confirms these pools and porticos existed, and they're exactly where John said they would be, showing the author of John knew Jerusalem very well. Okay? Now, here's another one. The pavement, Gabatha, of John 18.13... And Solomon's porch in the temple precincts, John 10, 22, 23, have been found, folks. Google it. They've been found. Again, 
Archaeologists have unearthed Jacob's well at Sychar in John 4, 5. and mentioned Jacob's well. They found that well exactly in Sychar or Sychar, as John 4, 5 says. You guys with me? Okay. More, a few more. An inscription found in Caesarea confirms Pilate's role as the prefect of Judea during the time of Christ. And to show you how they were crucified, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can find the photo on Google. Search for this. The discovery of bone box in ossuary, where they had the bones of the deceased, still preserved, of a crucified man named Yohanan from the first century Palestine, confirms the fact that nails were used to pierce the ankles of the victim because they found a bone with a spike in it. That's what they found. Such was the case of Christ, of course, and this discovery is significant in answering the skeptics who believe that the Romans used only ropes to tie the victim's legs to the cross. One final example. One final example for now. There's a lot, but I'm just going to quote so you can see how accurate your faith is. In 1990, guess what they found, folks? The burial grounds of Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest, and his family were uncovered. They found the burial lot of Caiaphas and his family, showing he existed. You got it? Now, let me give you some testimonials of skeptics who the Holy Spirit converted to the faith due to the archaeological evidence. Sir William Ramsey spent 30 years in Asia Minor wanting to destroy faith in the Bible. So he went there as an archaeologist. After 30 years, he became a convert and a believer in Jesus Christ because of what he found. And so I quote him, quote, this is what he says about Luke and Acts, because he tried to use Luke and Acts to falsify Luke and Acts. And every time he found something, it confirmed Luke and Acts. Look what he says, quote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians, end quote. Again, quoting Ramsey, Luke is unsurpassed in respects of his trustworthiness. No one greater than him. The man became a believer. The Holy Spirit used archaeology to convince him of the truth of the gospel. When's the last time you hear atheists or agnostics or Ehrman mentioning these as corroborating evidence for the historicity of the Bible? They won't tell you. You need to find it. And glory to God, God has raised up honest men and women to make these facts known. But wait, what about Old Testament history? Nelson Gluitt, who was an archaeologist and a Jew, and I believe he was a liberal Jew. Look what he says. Quote, what does he say about the historicity of the Bible? Nelson Gluitt, quote, it may be stated categorically, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever con controverted a biblical references, reference. And he's right, and I'll explain what in a minute what I mean. And again, the most incredibly accurate historical memory of the Bible, and particularly so when it is fortified by archaeological fact. Now, what does he mean? Most of the attacks on the Old Testament ministry is not because they found archaeology contradicting the Bible. It's because of the dating of some of the archaeological facts. They have found archaeological facts that confirm the existence of Joseph and the Exodus but the reason why they don't accept them as archaeological confirmation is because they date the Exodus later. The findings that they discovered would be around 1500 BC, but they're convinced that the Exodus took place later. But if you go with that time period, then all the archaeological facts fit like a glove. So it's not that the Bible has been falsified. It's either they haven't found evidence or they date the archaeological evidence either later or earlier than when the Bible says these events happen. Okay? So Nelson Gluick is right. Now let me continue. And by the way, Anna Chung, our sister, has a YouTube channel 
where she provides these historical archaeological facts. Her YouTube channel. Go to Ann Chung. Anna Chung. She's here. She's one of my mods. Let me quote a few more people. Here it is. This is Earl Radmacher. Okay. He was a former president of Western Conservative Baptist Seminary, and he says, quote, I listened to him, Nelson Gluick, who was a liberal, by the way. So he's talking about he studied under this man when he was at Temple Emmanuel in Dallas, and he got rather red in the face and said, I've been accused of teaching the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. I want it to be understood that I have never taught this. He didn't believe the Bible. All I've ever said is that in all my archaeological inv investigation, I have never found one artifact of antiquity that contradicts <clears throat> any statement of the Word of God. He's saying, I don't believe it's inspired in Aaron, but I'm just stating a fact. There was another skeptic. You guys listening? There was another skeptic named Dr. Clifford Wilson, who, again, due to the evidence, converted by the grace of God's Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit used evidence to convert him. Look what he said. After finding so many discoveries, quote, It is the studied conviction of this writer that the Bible is the ancient world's most reliable history textbook. textbook. A skeptic who now became a believer in the Bible. What did he say? It is the studied conviction. I've studied this. It's not just opinion. Of this writer that the Bible is the ancient world's most reliable history textbook. And Dr. Wilson, like Ramsey, praises Luke's accuracy. Look what he says about Luke. Are you ready? You guys ready? I hope I'm not boring you. It's all in those articles that I gave you links to, and I'll pin them as a comment. Okay? Look what he says. Okay? Dr. Wilson. Quote, Luke demonstrated a remarkably accurate knowledge of geographical and political ideas. He referred correctly to provinces that were established at that time as indicated in Acts 15, verse 6. He demonstrated a clear knowledge of local customs, such as those relating to the speech of the Lyconians, Acts 14, 11. Some aspects relating to the foreign woman who was converted at Athens, Acts 17, 34. And he even knew that the city of Ephesus was known as the temple keeper of Artemis, Acts 19.35. <clears throat> okay? He refers to different local officers by their exact titles. Exact titles, mind you. The proconsul, deputy of Cyprus, Cyprus Acts 13.7. The magistrates at Philippi, Acts 16.20 and 35. The polytarchs. Another word for magistrates. He's using the right title at the right time. At Thessalonica, Acts 17, verse 6. The proconsul of Achaia, Acts 18, verse 12. And the treasurer of Corinth, Adili, which was the title of the man known as Erastus at Corinth, Acts 19, 22, Romans 16, 23. Luke had accurate knowledge about various Local events, such as the famine in the days of Claudius Caesar, Acts 11, 29. He is aware that Zeus and Her Hermes were worshipped together at Lystra, though this was unknown. Let me repeat. This was unknown to modern historians. Acts 4, 11 and 12. He knew that Diana Artemis was especially the goddess of the Ephesians, Acts 19, 28. And he was able to describe the trade at Ephesus in religious images. You guys blown away? And then he concludes, those who know the facts now recognize that the New Testament must be accepted as remarkably accurate source book. You see the evidence God has given you to have no doubt the Bible is historically accurate. The Jesus of history is the Jesus of the Gospels and he is Lord and he's risen. Now let me... Quote from Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. He interviews John McRae, a renowned New Testament archaeologist. Page 99. John McRae, he's interviewing him about archaeology for the New Testament. So let me read that excerpt from The Case for Christ. Okay? Let me read it for you. 
Archaeology may support the cr credibility of Luke, but he isn't the only author of the New Testament. I wondered what scientists would have to say about John, whose gospel was sometimes considered subject because he talked about locations that couldn't be verified. Some scholars charge that since he failed to get these ba basic details straight, John must not have been close to the events of Jesus' life. That conclusion, however, has been turned upside down in recent years. Quote, there have been several discoveries that have shown John to be very accurate, unquote, McRae pointed out. Again, quoting McRae, notice, for example, John 5, 1 of 15 records how Jesus healed an invalid by the pool of Bethesda. John provides the detail that the pool had five porticos. For a long time, people cited this as an example of John being inaccurate because no such place have, had been found. But more recently, the pool has been excavated. Glory to our Lord Jesus, vindicating the honor of his inspired authors and apostles. It lies maybe 40 feet below ground, and sure enough, there were five porticos, which means colonnaded porches or walkways, exactly as John described. As you have other discoveries, the pool of Siloam from John 9-7, Jacob's well from John 4-12, the probable location of the stone pavement near Jaffa Gate, where Jesus appeared before Pilate, even Pilate's own identity all of which have lent historical credibility to John's gospel. So th this challenges the allegation that the gospel of John was written so long after Jesus that it can't be possibly accurate, I asked. This is Lee Strobel asking him. And he says, quote, most definitely, he replied. And then John Elder, someone I'm quoting, who's also an expert in these areas, states emphatically, quote, nowhere has archaeology, archaeological evidence, nowhere, John Elder, in his book, Prophets, Idols, and Diggers, an archaeologist, who knows archaeology, nowhere has archaeological evidence refuted the Bible's history. Let me repeat, nowhere has archaeological evidence refuted the Bible's history. So don't let them deceive you, folks. These are the evidences they won't share with you. But they're there, and they're honest men who are sharing these facts. So now... Let me quote William Lane Craig. So far, are you with me? Let me quote William Lane Craig. This is in this article, and I'll post them in the description box and as a comment. Here you go. Are you ready? William Lane Craig. Okay, let me quote. Okay. This comes from, let me get you the name of the work. William Lane Craig, on guard, defending your faith with reason and precision. Okay? Pages 193, 194. 193, 194. Was the author, meaning Luke of Acts, reliable in getting the facts straight? The book of Acts enable, enables us to answer that question decisively. The book of Acts overlaps significantly with secular history of the ancient world, and the historical accuracy of Acts is indisputable. This has recently been demonstrated anew by Colin Hemmer. Remember the name, get his book. Colin Hemmer, a classical scholar who turned to New Testament studies, in his book, The Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History. Colin Hemmer, he wrote this book, you can get it on Amazon, The Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History. Hemmer goes through the Book of Acts with a fine-tooth comb, pulling out a wealth of historical detail ranging from what would have been common knowledge down to details that only a local person would know. Again and again, Luke's accuracy is demonstrated. From the sailings of the Alexandrian corn fleet to the coastal terrain of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean islands to the peculiar titles of local officials, Luke gets it right. According to Professor Sherwin White, quote, the confirmation of historicity in Acts is overwhelming. Let me read. Overwhelming. Any attempt to reject its historicity, even the matters of detail, must now appear absurd, Shabir. 
The judgment of Sir William Ramsey, a world famous archaeologist, still stands. Quote, Luke is a historian of the first rank. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians, end quote. Given Luke's care and demonstrated reliability, as well as his contact with eyewitnesses, within the first generation after the events, this author is trustworthy. Now, I'm going to quote the late James D.G. Dunn. He thought there were some mistakes in Luke, that Quirinius wasn't the governor of Syria when a census was called at the time of Jesus' birth. He thought he was wrong. And he also thought that in Acts 5, 33 to 39, Luke was mistaken in quoting Gamaliel and mentioning Tudus. Actually, Dunn was wrong, not Luke. But even though he thinks those two are mistakes, notice what, again, this shows that he's not a blind inerrantist. He thinks Luke made mistakes. But now notice what he says, guys. Pay attention. When even an enemy of inerrant inerrancy makes these admissions, you know your faith is solid. This comes from his book, Beginning from Jerusalem, chapter 21, the sources, pages 75 to 76. Look what he says. Those deductions are strengthened by the we passages in Acts, because he's talking about the author of Acts is an eyewitness to some of these events. And I'll conclude with what William Lane Craig says about it. They certainly provide prima facie evidence that the author was personally present during the sequences described, the beginning and end of Paul's Aegean mission, Agian mission, and his final arrival in and departure from Palestine. But one of the implications which can obviously be drawn from them also is that the author had opportunity to consult participants in the early phases of his history. So what he's saying, done, is that the author was an eyewitness to many of the events that he wrote which means he had contact with eyewitnesses. Not only did he know Paul, he knew James, the so-called brother of the Lord, so he could get information from reliable eyewitnesses to Jesus, strengthening the historicity of Luke and Acts. That's what he's telling you. So let's continue. According to the first we passage, according to the first we passage, 16, 10 to 17, Acts 16, 10 to 17, he spent some time in the company of Silas, one of the leading men among the brothers, 1522. And Silas was an eyewitness of Peter, James, and John, the so-called brother of the Lord, because John, the brother, I'm sorry, James, the brother of John, had been martyred, right? One of the leading men among the brothers. That is, in this case, the Jerusalem disciples. According to the third we passage, Acts 21, 8 to 18, he stayed in Caesarea for several days with Philip, 21, 8 to 10, one of the leaders of the Hellenistic group, which emerge in chapter 6 and the evangelists of Samaria, chapter, chapter 8. Now, let me explain why that's important. Philip is one of the original seven deacons along with Stephen, whom the apostles appointed, which means Philip was an eyewitness to Stephen, an eyewitness to the apostles such as Peter, James, and John. And Luke says, I and Paul and the others met Philip and stayed at his home. Okay, now who else did he meet? There he encountered the prophet Agabus, 2110, who had pro, had who would have provided another link with the earlier history of both Jerusalem and Antioch. Agabus also knew the eyewitnesses. He's mentioned Acts 11 as a prophet who was filled with the Spirit and was inspired by the Spirit to predict the future. And Agabus knew the apostles, knew Paul and Barnabas, and Luke met him. Okay? And on the way to Jerusalem... Itself, he stayed at the house of Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple. Twenty-one sixteen, the lack of first-hand we reports during Paul's imprisonment in Jerusalem at Caesarea is surprising, but could have a number of explanations. And the we, where he mentions himself as part of the group we twenty-seven one, may be sufficient for the conclusion that the author must have spent some time in Caesarea, during which he would have had plenty of opportunity to consult those from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Now notice what Dunn says, who's not an inerrantist, who thinks the Bible has mistakes. A reasonable deduction, therefore, is that Luke both had personal involvement with Paul's mission and that he was able to draw 
upon, draw on, firsthand eyewitness reports for at least much of the substance of the earlier episodes which he narrates in Acts. So far, are you with me, guys? Because now I'm going to quote what Dunn goes on to say. Quote, this is what he goes on to say. Often overlooked in assessments of Acts is the degree of concurrence. Notice what he says. This is someone who's not in narratives, guys. The degree of agreement, concurrence between Acts and the data to be gleaned from Paul's letters as to his basic movements. The point can be documented effectively in a chart on the following pages. And he gives you the chart, which I couldn't reproduce, but I'm going to quote. Now notice, he's amazed at Luke's historical accuracy to the minute detail. This comes from page 77 and pages 80, 81. Look what he says, guys. Okay, almost done. And we'll open up the Skype if you have questions. The details will be re reviewed as we proceed. But the overall impression strongly suggests that the author Acts was well informed about Paul's life and mission. Four, it is a striking fact that whereas the Gospel of Luke, there are only a few details which can be correlated with information from non-biblical sources. Now watch what he says about Acts. In the case of the Acts of Luke, the number of such details is substantial. For example, the striking account of the death of Herod Agrippa the first. Acts 12, 20, 23, is paralleled in its main details by Josephus, Antiquities, and must have been the subject of many a storyteller's performance. Luke's knowledge of it, as no doubt Josephus, probably came from such common knowledge, not from any literary source, with Luke's own take on the story, most evident in the final verse, 12, 23. Now watch what else he says. A feature worth noting is the examples of these correlations become frequent, they're more frequent, where you have extra biblical confirmation of what Luke says in Acts, from the beginning of the we passages. From the time where he mentioned himself as an eyewitness, we have extra biblical corroboration, even much more so. Indeed, since William Ramsey was converted, he's another men person mentions Ramsey, to a high view of the reliability of Acts, students of Acts have regularly been impressed by Luke's historical accuracy on various small details on which a writer with no personal experience of the events he narrates might well have stumbled. Did you catch what he's saying? He's the second person who said this. Luke gets minute, minor details accurate. Details that someone who was an eyewitness would have not noticed or been mistaken. Not Luke. So watch here. Look what he says, and he's going to give you Examples. Luke knows that Herod Antipas was only titled Tetrarch of Galilee, Acts 13.1. Whereas Agrippa I and II were both properly titled King, chapter 12, verse 1, chapter 25, verse 13. Since both were granted the royal title by Gaius and Claudius, he uses the correct title proconsul for the Roman governors of Cyprus, Cyprus, Sergius Paulus, Acts 13, verse 7, and of Corinth. Gal Galileo, Acts 18.12, the only New Testament writer to use the proper Greek equivalent, Antipatos, of the Latin proconsul, governor of a senatorial province, whereas Felix and Festus were only procurators of Judea, governor, hegemon, of a minor province, Acts 23.24, Acts 26.30. He's getting all these minute details right. That someone else may, may have stumbled or got wrong if he was an eyewitness. Philippi is correctly, correctly described as a colony, colonia, Acts 16.12. And its chief magistrates as praetors, strategoi, Acts 16.20. The city magistrates of Thessalonica, however, are properly designated politarchs, politarchai, 17.6 a title which Luke could not have derived from literally sources. He could not have gotten this from writings at that time since it is not attested in Greek literature known to us, though we know the title from Macedonian inscriptions. So far, are you blown away? Are you blown away? Because I got more. Okay. Now watch what else he goes on to say. 
His report of an expulsion of the Jews from Rome by Claudius, Acts 18.2, is confirmed by the famous report of Suetonius, cited above. His knowledge of the several Ephesians officials named in Acts 19 is exact. Proconsul, 1938. That's the chapter and verse. Secretary of State, Town and Clerk, Grammatios, Acts 19.35. The Asiarchs, Asiarchs, Azirakhoi, Azirakhoi, Acts 19.31. Men of status within the civic administration. And he uses the correct term, Agoraios, for a provincial assize in Ephesus, Acts 19.38. And his knowledge of the rights of Roman citizenship and of judicial procedures reflect the conditions of the middle decades of the first century, not those of the latter decades. You know what he means? If he was writing later in the first century, he would have gotten it wrong. This shows he's writing in the middle decades. Middle decades are 50s and 60s. Right on. During which he probably wrote Acts. No, he wrote it in the middle decades. Also worth noting is the extent to which Josephus in particular confirms many of Luke's details, which otherwise we might attribute it to his storytelling imagination. So notice what Josephus says to show that Luke is right. The rebels, Judas of Galilee and uh, Tudus, Acts 5, 36, 37, even if Luke is confused as to their dates. No, he's not confused. And I'll explain why. You're confused. And the Egyptian, Acts 21, 38. Not only the dating of the pro procuratorships of Felix and Festus in Judea, Acts 23, 24, and Acts 24, 27, and the identity of the high priest Ananias, Acts 23, verse 2, Acts 24, verse 1, as well as the, as the names of Felix's wife, Drusilla, Acts 24, 24, and of Agrippa II's wife, Bernice, Acts 25, 13, but also his characterization of Felix, Festus, and Agrippa II, Luke is spot on. Final paragraph. Okay, uh, scum sucker. My Skype is open. Call me so I can bury you in filth for the glory of Jesus Christ. Skype is open. I'm not getting. Let's see. Let me read the final. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I have to muzzle a dog who's barking thinking he's smart enough. Okay. Let's see. Oh, it's this douchebag, lowlife, whose mother was a Shia prostitute who was abused by the Shia who lives in a basement and stalks people. Yeah, get rid of that scum. No disrespect to scum. Final paragraph. Quote, in an age when there were no almanacs, he didn't have an almanac, providing ready information regarding titles and dates of officials and no easy access to official records by someone of Luke's likely rank and status, the slips already indicated are readily explicable. He didn't make a slip. That's Dunn's erroneous assumption. At the same time, the accuracy of such details and representations, as have just been listed, can hardly be better explained than by Luke's own involvement with those caught up in the events or with the events themselves or by his having access to eyewitness accounts of the events. You, know, you see what Dunn is saying? Dunn is saying this accuracy and minute details is proof Luke was either an eyewitness or interviewed eyewitnesses. So what more do you guys want? Even Dunn, who's not a narratist, who erroneously thinks Luke was mistaken as opposed to thinking Josephus was wrong and Luke is the one who's right, correcting Josephus. He's saying this information could only come if Luke was an eyewitness or interviewed eyewitnesses. What more do you want for your faith? So let me end it with William Lane Craig from the book On Guard. And I'll open up to Skype if you're interested. If not, we'll wrap it up. And Lord willing, I'll try to do another session before I head back to Haines and fly out Thursday with your prayers for a miracle, right? Finally, here it is, William Lane Craig from On Guard, defending your faith with reason and precision. Okay? Pages 191, 193. Okay, listen to what he says. Agreeing with Dunn, that Luke is an eyewitness. And then I'm going to show you one detail that's mind-blowing, showing you Luke was writing before 64 AD, AD, around 62 AD. The internal evidence of Luke shows he's write, writing around 
62 AD. Okay, I'm going to prove it to you. These are facts that these skeptics won't mention or try to distort and ignore or undermine. Here's what Craig says. Listen, quote, does gospel writers have a proven track record of historical reliability? Again, let's look at just one example. Luke. Luke was the author of a two-part work, the gospel of Luke, the gospel of Luke, right? <clears throat> look what he says. And the Acts of the Apostles. These are really one work and are separate in our Bibles only because the church grouped the Gospels together in the New Testament. Yeah, it's one author. The author wrote Luke, wrote Acts. Now notice how he begins Luke. Luke is the Gospel author who writes most self-consciously as a historian. In the preface he writes, now I want you to pay attention. I've mentioned this previous sessions, but we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively until it comes second nature by the power of the Holy Spirit. Look who he's writing to. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, <clears throat> just as they were delivered to us, he's including himself in the us, they were delivered to us, handed to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So he's saying, I got this from eyewitnesses. I heard from the eyewitnesses. I met the eyewitnesses. They're the ones who taught me. It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely, meaning examining all things meticulously, for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, meaning friend of God, that you may know the truth. So you have no doubt. I'm writing this to convince you and have no doubt, absolute truth that I'm writing to you concerning things of which you have been informed. Did you catch what he said? He's writing to Most Excellent Theophilus. That title, Most Excellent, was a title given to government officials, people who worked for the government, for empire. So he's writing to an official, and he's saying, I've carefully investigated all these things, so you have no doubt everything I say is absolutely true, historically correct. But wait, he also writes about the historical Jesus, his crucifixion, death, and resurrection. And he's writing to an official and telling the official, have no doubt, these are all facts because there are witnesses to a lie who can testify. How did Luke get away with it if he's lying? And I'll explain to you why he's writing to an official. Let's continue with Craig. This preface is written in classical Greek. So he's writing in a Greek that is so polished, showing Luke was highly educated. Classical Greek, such as the great Greek historians used. After this, Luke switches to more common Greek, but he has put his readers on alert that he can write if he wants to, like the learned historian. He speaks of his lengthy investigation of the story he's about to tell and assures us that it's based on eyewitness information and is accordingly the truth. Now, who is this author we call Luke? He was clearly not himself an eyewitness to Jesus' life. But we discover an important fact about him from the book of Acts. Watch this, guys. Beginning in the 16th chapter of Acts, when Paul reaches Troas in modern-day Turkey, the author suddenly starts using the first-person plural. We set sail from Troas to Samothrace. We remained in Philippi some days as we were going to the place of prayer, etc., the most obvious explanation is that the author had joined Paul on his evangelistic tour of the Mediterranean cities. Eventually, he accompanies Paul back to Israel and finally to Jerusalem. What this means is that the author of Luke and Acts was, in fact, in firsthand contact with the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life and ministry in Jerusalem. Watch here. Skeptical... Critics have done backflips to try to avoid this conclusion. They say that the use of the first person plural acts should not be taken literally. How convenient. It was just a literary, literary device that was common in ancient sea voyage stories. Now watch what Craig says. Never mind that many of the passages in Acts are not about Paul's sea voyage. So much for that argument. But take place on land. 
The more important point, guys, listen to this. The more important point is that this theory, when you check it out, turns out to be sheer fantasy, a lie. They're lying through their teeth, basically. There just was no literary device in the ancient world of sea voyage in the first person plural. The, th the whole thing has been shown to be scholarly fiction. See, he's being nice. You're a damn liar. That's what you are. There is no avoiding the conclusion that Luke Acts was written by a traveling companion, Paul, who had the opportunity to interview eyewitnesses to Jesus' life while in Jerusalem. When's the last time Pine Creek or Arn Ra or Bart Ehrman or Matt Dillahunty will mention these facts for you? When's the last time you heard them, I should say? Holy Spirit, save me from stammering and confusion. You know what that means, folks? When Luke writes about Mary's experience is because he interviewed eyewitnesses. And if you go to Acts 21, 18 and 20, Luke says he was there when he met James, the so-called brother of our Lord, which means he either interviewed James, who was raised in the same household with Jesus, or Mary was still alive and he interviewed her. That's how solid the historicity of your New Testament documents happen to be. But now here, let me blow you away. You ready? You guys ready to see why this is amazing? Luke ends Acts with Paul awaiting trial in Rome. He's under house arrest, house prison, where he can have visitors come to him and he's preaching the gospel for at least two years. And he's waiting trial to meet Caesar because he requested to have an audience with Caesar because Paul is going to go and preach the gospel to Caesar. Okay, now watch this. The fact that Luke ends with Paul imprisonment and doesn't tell us what happened. Did he meet Caesar? If so, was he set free or killed? And the fact that he doesn't mention that Paul was martyred and the fact that he doesn't mention Peter was martyred because they were martyred around 64, 68 AD. And the fact that he doesn't mention James, the Lord's brother, as being martyred. And the fact that he doesn't mention Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed is proof he was writing around 62 AD. Why, why is that proof? Okay. According to church history, there's a Christian named Hezekip. Hazakisipios, Hazagisipos, Hazagisipos, my lift, Hazagisipos, who says that James, the Lord's brother, was thrown out of the parapet, the pinnacle of the temple, and when he landed, they stoned him to death around 62 AD. And why was James stoned? Because he says that Jesus, the Son of Man, is at the door. When they heard him say, Jesus, his so-called brother, we know he's not his uterine brother, but called his brother nonetheless, was at the door because he's the son of man who's about to come down to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. They threw him off the pinnacle. He landed and they stoned him to death. 62 AD. Now, why is that important? Well, Luke mentions the martyrdom of Stephen who doesn't play a significant role. He mentions the martyrdom of James, John's brother, in Acts 2, verses 1 and 2, by Herod. But the main characters of Acts happen to be Peter for the first part and Paul for the second part. And Luke contains Jesus' prophecy in Luke 21 that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed because of the Jewish rejection of Jesus. And he as a son of man would come in judgment to destroy that place. Confirmed in Acts 6, 14. And James, the so-called brother of the Lord, plays an important role. And yet, he doesn't mention James being martyred, Peter being martyred, Paul being martyred. Nor does he mention Jesus' prophecy being fulfilled because he doesn't record the Romans coming to destroy the temple in Jerusalem. All of which would have been important facts that he would have mentioned if he's writing after these events. The fact that he doesn't mention James being martyred, Peter being martyred, and Paul not being martyred or set free but still in prison proves that he ended it with Paul's house arrest. 
because that's when he finished the writing. When Paul was still in prison, when Peter was still alive, James was still alive, and Jerusalem Temple had not been destroyed, proving that he was writing around 62 AD. That should blow your mind away. You know why? Because scholars believe Luke and Acts are after Mar Matthew and Mark. Well, if the internal evidence proves Acts was finished around 62 AD, that means Luke is earlier, let's say 60. But then Matthew and Mark are earlier. You now push the Gospels around the 40 to 60 AD range. When thousands of eyewitnesses are alive, both hostile and friendly. Moreover, moreover, remember I said, remember that title, Most Excellent Theophilus? He again mentions Theophilus in Acts 1, verses 1 of 5. Let me read it for you. Let me read what he says there. Okay. Same Theophilus. Look what he says there. Acts 1, verses 1 of 5. Revised Standard Version. Look what he says. In the first book, note it's first book. I means this is the second one. O Theophilus. Proving he wrote Luke to the same man, Theophilus. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. After he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, to them he presented himself alive after his passion by many proofs. Wow. He told Theophilus, what I'm about to write to you is historical fact, irrefutable proofs that I've carefully examined, which you yourself can confirm or falsify. And what are the facts he wrote? Jesus was killed, raised, and physically taken to heaven because the eyewitnesses are alive. How did Luke get away with this? Okay, now watch what he says. I wrote to you in my first book about the life of Jesus up to his physical ascension. Now I'm writing the second book. Watch what he says. And I'm telling you, Jesus appeared physically alive after his death with many proofs, appearing to them for 40 days and speaking of the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but before many days you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you know what's amazing? Acts 1, 9 to 12, Luke records to Theophilus, Jesus then physically ascended in front of the eyes of the disciples. The disciples and apostles are still alive, which you can interview, and they saw with their physical eyes, Jesus physically, bodily, ascending from a mountain, entering cloud, disappearing to enter in heaven. And these are facts you can confirm, Theophilus. You know why that's mind-blowing, if you're listening? You know why that's mind-blowing? Because it's most likely that Theophilus, because he's an official is the man who will be there presiding when Paul is taken before Caesar, which is why many people believe that Luke and Acts are Paul's defense treatise, that Luke and Acts are written. It's a written defense of Paul to present to Theophilus, to present to Caesar. Because most excellent Theophilus would be a term indicating that Theophilus is an official. So Paul, Luke is writing it while they're at Rome and Paul is under house arrest as Paul's defense treatise to present to Theophilus to present to Caesar. Yeah, I didn't make this up. I'm not that smart. Do you see how solid and overwhelming the facts of history are that your Lord Jesus became flesh, walked this earth, did the things and said the things the Gospels say he said and did, died, rose again, appeared physically in front of eyewitnesses, right? And those eyewitnesses, by the power of the Holy Spirit, turned the world upside down by the miracles they did, by the same Spirit that empowered Christ, worked with Christ, which Christ sent from heaven to them. 
That's how solid your faith is. That's how solid your faith is. Here's the links again. Lord willing, later, I'll put it in the description box and I'll pin it as a comment. Folks, don't let these tools of the devil, these atheist agnostics, Muslims deceive you. Let me repeat, the honest scholars, archaeologists admit, there is not a single archaeological fact that has contradicted the Bible. The difference is the dating. Sometimes they assign a date to an archaeological find that <clears throat> contradicts their presumed dating of an event mentioned by the Bible. And that's due to their giving a wrong dating to the events in the Bible, like the Exodus. Go to the website, Patterns of Evidence. There, that man did multi-part series of documentaries where he shows that if you don't accept that the Exodus took place during the time of Ramesses, but took place at the time of Amunhotep, all the evidence falls in. There's even evidence from Egypt and outside of Egypt for Joseph's existence as a foreign ruler at the time of Egypt. You get it? So there you go. In fact, there's a renowned conservative Christian Egyptologist. He started a YouTube channel and he's doing excellent work. I hope I find him here. He is destroying the atheist agnostic misinterpretation of the archaeological data, which they try to pit against the Exodus. Thank you. Inspiring Philosophy has a video on it. And let me find this man. He may have interviewed the same man, right? Let me find his name. Okay. I have him. I subscribe to his channel and I forget his name, man. I'll try to get him on my channel. Okay. He's phenomenal. The atheists hate him. Here he is. Yep, it's his name. Oh, here you go. Even on Capturing Christianity, he's interviewed. The Egyptologist has strong evidence for a real exodus. Here's the link. Capturing Christianity, April 12, 2021. This Egyptologist has strong evidence for a real exodus. And I'll pin this as a comment. His name is Dr. David Falk. F-A-L-K. Here it is, guys. God has spoiled you guys. Spoiled you rotten. In the light of internet, where you only pay for internet, he's given you massive, overwhelming, irrefutable, historical, archaeological, scientific facts. Your Bible is real history. Here it goes. Here's the link. I'll put it in the description box. I'm going to listen to it myself when I'm walking. And let me get his own channel. Dr. David Falk. Subscribe to his channel. Watch his videos. He's amazing. And atheists hate him. Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Here's his channel. Ancient Egypt and the Bible. A conservative Christian who knows Egyptology. He has a PhD in Egyptology, Egyptian studies. And he's showing you what these lying skeptics, atheists, are not showing you. Yep, it's David Fox. See, same guy, F-A-L-K. There you go. Are you blessed and overwhelmed by how much our God loves us? That he's saying, oh, you're still not convinced the Bible is true and Jesus is Lord and he's alive? Here, let me give you all the facts, scientific facts, medical facts, near-death experiences, the Shroud of Turin, historical, textual facts, fulfilled prophecy. What more do I need to give you besides me showing up? Even in that, you'll explain away. This is why, if it's based on evidence, the whole world would be followers of Jesus. But it's not evidence. Because you have sin, you have Satan, and you have tools of Satan trying to destroy your faith because they hate God and want to suppress the truth. Because they don't want to bow the knee to him. <clears throat> now, since it's been over two hours, let's end it. Let's wrap it up. Lord willing, I should be able to do a session tomorrow. But guys, please pray for me. <clears throat> honestly, I mean it from my heart. If you love me for the sake of the Lord and you believe God is using me to bless you, please pray faithfully daily. Mention me and my daughters, even their mother, to repent. Ask the Lord Jesus to grant my daughters and I miraculous, divine, physical safety, protection, and health, that I stay healthy, stay strong, and disciplined. The Lord protect my daughters, no harm to them. If the Lord tarries, that he gives me grace to see them grow up 
to be godly women that won't need me anymore. They'll be in love with Jesus, serving the Lord, and I die before them, meaning before anything happens to them. If the Lord tarries, may he not tarry, may he come in our lifetime. Ask the Lord to grant them salvation, to love Jesus with all their heart, and that I love Jesus and fall more in love with Jesus and be holy and save me from my sinfulness and all the mistakes I made to save me from them. And ask the Lord Jesus to not give me what I deserve, not to fall into scandal and shame the Lord. Because, brethren, I've been reading some stories of some men, and I won't mention this one in particular. I am fearful of what's happening to these men in ministries who are doing great work destroying Satan. But because of some moral lapses, because they lack better judgment, Satan's now using that to discredit them because his children, atheists and Muslims, are all over it. Pray God will save me from that, that I finish the race and bring Christ's glory, not for the praise of men, but to show that I love the Lord and I won't shame him so that Satan will not use that to try to destroy the faith of many. So pray God preserves me. And again, thank you. Many of you have stepped up to support via Patreon and PayPal in spite of the hardship in spite of the wars, in spite of the disasters and rising gas prices. Thank you, because that helps me continue to do ministry, even though the Lord doesn't need me. And don't forget Anna Chung, Miriam just posted her link. She has an excellent YouTube channel where she also provides historical archaeological confirmation for the Bible. Right? What do you mean, grant you a wife, buddy? I'm still looking for a godly wife. And that's another thing. If God wants me to be celibate and single, ask the Lord to give me perfect, natural self-control to remain pure and not burn. But if there's a godly woman out there, even though I had my eyes on one, I don't think that's going to happen. She thinks there is no remarriage for whatever reason. That's her conviction. If it's not it, ask the Lord to release me and move on. <clears throat> God's will be done. He knows what's perfect for all of us, right? In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. The Father's heart, the love of the Spirit, our love, our heart. May he fill us with the Spirit, wash us in his blood, and do that for our loved ones, my daughters. And keep us in love with him to never deny him, but love him and glorify him even unto death. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Abba, have mercy. Son of God, have mercy. Holy Spirit, have mercy. Maranatha, in Jesus' name. Now. Guys, Orthodox Shahada, my brother Kai, told me to share this link. Our brother Perry Robinson, who's a theological beast, an Orthodox theological beast, started his YouTube channel. And I'll pin this in the description box, Lord willing, and as a comment. Here's the link. Okay, here's the link. Thank you, Kai. I hope you're listening. I didn't forget you, brother. Glory to Jesus Christ as these Mohammedan whores of the devil bark like Muhammad is barking in hell because their mothers were Shia prostitutes who did muta for Allah and his messenger but didn't get paid for it. We're going to muzzle your prophet and destroy and damn him by the power of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing you can do except bark like dogs. So keep barking dogs and show me I'm in your mind and head rent free like I'm in the mind of Allah rent free by the power of Jesus. So here you go. Here's a link. Here it is. Perry Robinson. Energetic procession, subscribe because he's going to be putting content. Energetic procession, here's the link, folks. Support this brother. He's the one who did a five hour meat fest, schooling Anthony, showing Anthony needs to repent. May God destroy his pride. Anthony, repent. Die to your man made tradition and your biblical perversion. Come home, brother. We're waiting for you in Jesus' name. Love you guys. Lord willing, I'll try to do a session tomorrow. Before I head back and I fly Thursday. So I love you guys and pray for me. Great crowd. We had over 380. May the numbers increase for the glory of Jesus, not for my praise. We love you, son of God. Take care.